Okay, well, it is 6.30, and so we're going to get started, and I just want to start, um, I'm going to call the meeting to order, but I want to just start by saying how delightful it is to be back in person. Uh, I have missed having, um, having you all here together. Um, I feel like that, that makes a difference. Anyway, it's good to see you all. Um, yeah, I'm so delighted to be back. Uh, all right, so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, and Reporting in progress. Sorry, I didn't know it would be that loud. So okay. Uh, you know, I, I also uh, usually, oh, wow, there we are. Uh, normally, if there's a projection, I try to move out of this seat, but I'm, I'm just going to hang out here. Um, and uh, my apologies in advance if my head blocks um, somebody behind. Um, all right, so uh, in reviewing and approving the agenda, uh, are there any changes that folks want to make? Uh, I didn't have anything on my radar to change. I just wanted to yeah. comment, to follow up on your, your comments, Madam Mayor, that this is our first attempt at a hybrid city council meeting um, using Zoom. I know some of our committee meetings have done this, but this is our first real attempt at going live, and we know we have a topic that there's a lot of people that would be, that will want to comment, so we'd ask you to to please be patient. This is a this is a, a work in progress. So hopefully all will go well, um, but we'll try to improve as we go forward. Okay. Any other um, thoughts on the agenda, team? No changes. Okay. So without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. Um, <coughs> so on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the of uh, the public to address the council on any item that is not otherwise on our agenda. If you have a comment you'd like to make that does pertain to something on our agenda, then um, uh, we'll ask you to make those comments either uh, as a part of that item or just before. Um, but if it's not on our agenda, now is the time. And as is true for all of our public comments, if you would say your name, where you live, and try to keep your comments to about two minutes, that would be uh, excellent. And um, I think that, oh, the other thing is, um, in the past, we've had a, a microphone uh, set up separately, but uh, for uh, tonight's meeting, and uh, this, this is, you know, we're seeing how this goes, uh, for members of the public who would like to comment, uh, there's a chair that's set up here at the table, and uh, there's a couple microphones here, because we want to make sure that you are adequately picked up, uh, particularly for folks who are uh, remote. Um, so, I think that is everything I need to say about that. Um, would anyone like to address the council on a topic not on our agenda? Yeah, go ahead, yep. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kiana Bromley. I live on 45 Easy Street, up on, off of Town Hill. Um, and I am coming today, I, I got a chance to speak to Jack earlier. Um, we live in a spot that has a really nice large lawn. <laughs> and I am a theater and music person and we're hoping to host a music series for the community free event on our lawn. Um, but it will, and it's gonna be on either Saturdays or Sundays through um, starting like we're hoping, again, August 15th through October 3rd. Uh, we have five bands lined up. We might have a sixth. Um, but the, and it would happen during daylight hours, a start of music would be from six to seven o'clock. Um, these will be amplified in some way so that the people at the event can hear it, but would, we would try to contain that amplification um, to our space and to the yard. But there's bound to be some sound that escapes out to our neighbors, um, and we have one band in particular that might be, they are a rock and roll band, they're local, they live, one of the members lives in town, um, and they're gonna be loud. So we are actually, um, I'm going to be applying for a variance to the noise ordinance, and I'm hoping to add it to your agenda for, the, for August 11th. Um, I will be giving a letter to all of my neighbors in the vicinity in the 250 foot radius um, and speaking with them in person, but I just wanted to come and say that I would love it to be added to the agenda so we could um, have that happen and then get that up and running. So the only issue with that is that we don't actually have an August 11th meeting, okay. but still coordinate with us and get us the letter in and we can, we can maybe do a special call-in meeting for that. 
Thank you. You do have some tough neighbors across the street, so watch okay. out. Me. Oh. <laughs> well, there we go. So All right. I, I think this is going to be great. I can't wait. Cool. And you're invited. <laughs> Everyone's invited. <laughs> thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Sure, I, I kind of missed the beginning, but um, there's a rumor in the homeless community about something allowing people to camp out in place. Yeah, so we will be taking up that as an um, item on our agenda in a little while, and this time is for topics that are otherwise not on our agenda. Okay, and so if yeah, you well, that's why I missed that, so yeah, I wasn't sure okay. if I was at the right meeting. No worries, yep, you're at the right meeting. Awesome. Yeah, and um, so we'll be taking that up a little bit later. And if you have a comment about that, um, yeah, we'll, I, I, definitely. Yeah, yeah, we'll be inviting the public to make comments yes, um, then. So great, thank, great. You. thank you. Not yeah. Uh, Steve Whitaker, if you don't know me by now, um, regarding public health and safety, I hear that. Uh, I see that on a lot of agenda items that we're really taking care of this. Uh, the Girton Park structure seems to be, uh, it's a real health hazard right now. I've asked the chief to speak to it, but he had, is bound by chain of command. Uh, the puke, the vomit, the feces, uh, the trash, uh, the dog food, uh, the dogs rolling in it, everybody's petting it, it's, it's, a, it's a scene. and. I was assured that it was going to get power washed weeks ago, but apparently now public works and, and parks and everybody's pointing at each other and nobody wants to get it done. It's a health hazard. I encourage the chief to string it with police tape right now. It's, it's a health hazard. Um, and I acknowledge that prior I went to bat that the folks using it deserved a place until other alternate places are found. But right now, those people are so abusive, even throwing a water bottle at a 95-year-old man who came to take pictures and lodged his complaint with, with the count with Bill. So it's, it's out of control. Uh, the sooner it gets moved, the better. It needs to be cleaned tomorrow morning. I'd ask you to take action on it tonight to make sure that that thing gets cleaned. You're going to need a truck to get a mattress and wet clothes from under the bridge. Uh, this can't wait any longer. Um, I suggest as moving it, uh, 12, either decide tonight or take it to the town garage and decide later. But if you decide tonight to move it to 12 Main, decide whether you want it privacy or not privacy. Consider the lot behind 12 Main on the back side of the lot facing the river would give a little bit of privacy with proximity to restrooms and maybe serve, continue to serve the population it serves. Um, I think people would be less likely to get as rowdy and rude to people as they do now. Um, so those are my, I'm trying to be concise and quick, but we, you could talk about it more. Uh, the bridge along the railroad track, the, the new, newest bridge, multi-use bridge, there's a gap on either end, two and a half inches. Uh, the, there was an aluminum formed piece that set in it to protect it, and it's too wide. Strollers, uh, scooters, wheels fall in. I similarly watched a five-year-old boy on a scooter coming down School Street today. He, his, he went head over. The, the, the scooter hit the sidewalk faults and he went head over the scooter. Uh, these are hazards and we keep doing optional projects and we've got, we need to prioritize these kinds of public safety projects. An, another 90-year-old woman walks around with her rectangular shopping basket she asked me to raise two things, enforce the ordinance about bikes and skateboards on the sidewalks and to re repair or restore the access between the multi-use path and the Capitol Plaza lot and between the Capitol Plaza lot and the Haney lot. Those two ir irregular dirt s slides are impassable for a, an elderly person frail pulling a shopping cart. Those are things that should not have been interrupted in accordance with our plan about interconnection of trails and, and walkability. It got disrupted by the new bridge and the assumption that the garage was going to fix it. It didn't, so it's time to fix those two dirt slopes coming right off. It may be the railroad right away 
is, is, is an issue. You may not be able to construct a ramp in the railroad. To, to, uh, Stephen, I, I, can, I can answer that. Um, but it's the, private property. The, and they won't allow it. Okay, so then do it this side of, the, at the edge of the right, right, take a hard right off of the bike path and then do a ramp attached to the blocks that we built the embankment with. Um, We've been looking at all those. Okay, angles. but looking at it and getting it solved is is a, is a issue. Similarly, the Main Street travel lane is continues to be blocked every Thursday morning and others by delivery trucks for Abishan. The He's the Abishan manager is risking losing a load because of the potholes in that that alley. Uh, the forklift going down that alley can tip a whole pallet off. So, using the new road in, eliminate four spots in the back corner by P Pie, the first two on the end of the first peninsula, and the second one on the the north end, the north same north peninsula will create enough turning radius for the trucks to come in on the new road, unload at Abishans, the beer trucks similarly, and exit through the, the alley by Jacob's Beer Garden. I, I, I'm over time. I'll leave the others for the next meeting. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, and thanks for bringing those things to our attention. Um, all right. Anyone else? Okay. All right, so we are on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Jack. I move the consent agenda. I'll second. Okay, motion and a second. Uh, further discussion? Uh, yeah, Lauren, go ahead. Just curious. You want um, to pull that even closer? Even yeah. closer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, wow. yeah, right, I know, <laughs> yeah, it's gotta be loud. COVID friendly. Um, <laughs> just, just curious when we're doing like tractor purchases and things, like. Is the city looking at electric yet for these kinds of purchases? I know they're probably not yes cost competitive. I'm just curious if we're like getting in the practice of. I, I'll have to check. I don't know the answer to that. We'll check on that. Just uh, nothing to hold up tonight, but just hope that we are building that into practices and encouraging that. I was also thinking about that. And my understanding, I, I'm very willing to be wrong about this, but my understanding is um, I, I don't know of any that exist. Um, Commercially, so anyway, to be continued. Uh, all right, uh, there's been a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Um, okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. Okay, so the consent agenda passes. Uh, so we are uh, up to the, we have a, a couple of appointments to make. Uh, so the first is to the uh, historic preservation committee and uh, we have one applicant for that which is uh, Yana Walder. Is Yana here? Okay, don't see Yana and um, I suppose they could be in attendance remotely. Um, no, not, I mean, they're not. Okay, okay. <laughs> all right, fair enough. Uh, though if you are on Yana, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and let us know that you're here. Um, uh, so okay, fair enough. Uh, we have. I'm going to move right into the other appointment, and then we can consider both uh, together. Uh, the other uh, appointment is to uh, the what is going to be a newly formed public restroom committee. And for that, uh, we have a couple of folks uh, who put their names in: uh, Shana Casper and Carolyn Ridpath. I don't see Carolyn. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't see Shana here, and I don't. I don't think I see Carolyn here either. Um, either of them on otherwise. If you, uh, yes, uh, Connor, go ahead. Sorry, Mayor. Uh, I, oh, I'm you're going to have to get real close, yep. real close. I'm usually very loud. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm on the Homelessness Task Force as a liaison from the council there, and uh, my recollection was we appointed Carolyn and Zach Hughes. Yes. The, the question came up, uh, do they need forms again? And I said I thought not probably because we had previously already appointed them to the Homelessness Task Force. Okay. So I know Zach Hughes was also okay. uh, selected by the task force. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Just double checking. So yes, go ahead, Dan. Just for clarification, Zach, his, app, his name should be put forward with these other two. I, I believe so, yeah. 
Okay. Um, so, um, assuming that none of these folks, and Zach, I don't think is, well, he could be there on a different page, I suppose. Um, again, if any of you are on uh, remotely, go ahead and unmute yourselves and let us know that you're here. Um, but otherwise, it sounds like none of the, the folks are here. Uh, so, uh, what would you like to do, team, for appointments? I'd make motion um, that we go into deliberative session on this as is our normal practice to consider the appointment uh, as allowed under 1 BSA section 313. Um, is there a second? There is a second. Um, further discussion? And I, I, it's executive session? Executive, it's executive, executive session. session. Sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. Yes, Connor. And would, would we be selecting, I think we have two counselors tonight as well. Would it make sense to appoint them as well so the committee can get up and running? I think so, yes. Yeah. Um, any further comments on this? Okay. Um, uh, all right, then. Most, there's been a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so we are going to um, go into the, the other room for a bit, um, and we'll, hopefully we'll be back uh, relatively soon. All right, thank you. Oh, I don't have a remote executive session. All right. Is there uh, is there a motion to go or to come out of executive session? Oh. So moved. I'll oh, second. Okay. Motion to second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. So we are back into regular session. And is there a motion? Uh, Mayor, I'm now I move to we appoint uh, Yana Walder to the Historic Preservation Commission, and Shana Casper, Carolyn Ridpath, and Zachary Hughes to the Public Restroom Committee along with city council representatives, uh, Connor Casey and Dan Richardson. Second. Okay, uh, there's a motion and a second. Any further conversation? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. All right, thank you uh, for, to all of you for stepping up uh, to serve in this way. We're so grateful. Uh, all right. So, all right. So now we are up to um, the uh, the city encampment re uh, response policy uh, review, and I think we have uh, some uh, presentation from uh, our yeah. assistant city manager. Yeah, it's, it's on the, so we've got two signs. Um, so if anyone needs their password, it's city hall open, and then it's city hall. <coughs> All right, and uh, so Cameron, are you going to be uh, projecting? I am. So for that, I am going to move. Okay. Out of that. I'm going to take down a seat. So while I present, I'm going to remove folks' ability to unmute themselves so that I don't have to check on that. And you may need to be right on top of the mic, too. I don't think I'm unmuted. No, I'm just saying. Get on top of the mic. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Right there. Hopefully that works. All right. Okay, I was like, is it not going to show up? Uh, John, do you mind hitting the light so folks in the room can hear? See? Thank you so much. All right. So I'm going to do this in the dark, apparently. No, kidding. So I know a lot of folks are here, and I'm sorry my back is to you. So if you can't hear, please holler, and I'll speak louder. Um, we're here to discuss a proposed policy um, that we're calling the City Encampment Response Policy. Um, I know that there's been a lot of conversation about this, so hopefully this presentation answers some questions and adds some clarity to why we're doing this, what sort of process we went through to get here, what sort of impact a policy like this may have on our community. I've got some common questions and answers that have come up through this process um, just so that I can hopefully answer some questions that from some folks may have. And then I'm going to outline what sort of next steps the city is doing regardless of, of steps and actions taken tonight. So to get to really, uh, well, first, 
I'm going to take a moment to say I know that this is a difficult conversation and that a lot of feelings have come up during this conversation. So when we get to the conversation part or the question part of this presentation, I'd like us all to remember sort of the humanity of the folks that we're talking about, um, things that this policy, folks that this policy could impact, and also um, remember to not generalize anyone. I'll certainly aim to not do that as well and just be respectful. So I want to sort of get into the why we created this policy and why we're proposing it to council. Um, to be very frank, there are folks camping now in our public parks and our public land. And there will continue to be folks camping because there's a lack of better or other options. And the city does not currently have a policy in place for staff to address those encampments. We were trying to make a policy that made um, restrictions available to the city so that we can improve on what's in place, which honestly is not much. There is also a need to determine where camping is and is not okay, which is what guidance we're seeking as staff from council and our other elected bodies. This aligns um, with both a court case out of the ninth district and guidance from our own state's attorney, which is really aiming to not criminalize homelessness. I'd want to start out also by acknowledging that this conversation in general can seem frightening. As um, I've heard a lot of feedback that says, I think this policy opens up the city for camping. Or it can say that, why would we put boundaries in place at all? And so I would say to that, it, it's just we need to be nuanced in how we talk about it and how we think about it. Um, you know, we're not trying to open up public land for anything that it shouldn't be used for. So I do want to talk a little bit about like the legal responsibility and why we put forward this policy. So there is a case precedent um, out of Boise that set legal precedent that basically ruled that um, public sleep, sl people who are, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to restart that sentence. Folks can sleep or camp on public property um, if there is no shelter space or legal uh, place for them to go. So. Um, people can be offered appropriate uh, shelter space um, and if there is a space open camping is not legal but it basically says that we can't bar folks from uh, getting a night's sleep on public property um, if there's no alternative shelters so I've heard some feedback about the Ninth District Court case and how it does not extend to Vermont currently and that is true but it's also a case that is the highest presence in the land right now, and it is an approach that's being supported by our state's attorney, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So again, um, you know, we've been told uh, as city staff by our legal counsel that it's appropriate and good to be proactive about this issue. And um, you know, we realize that this is something that will impact us, has impacted us, will continue to impact us, and we'd rather have um, standards in place to approach it than not. So as you may know or have heard, the state's hotel motel program, which was housing folks that were unhoused during COVID um, in our local hotels and motels has ended. And so general assistance housing, where people could um, petition the state to get housing vouchers, has returned to pre-COVID eligibility restrictions. And that is actually pretty restrictive. I think the priority goes to um, folks with children, folks with disabilities, and um, folks with families. And so unless there's a weather event, that's really who's available to get housing. And to be honest, there's limited shelter and housing capacity in all of our social services partners to begin with. And so what we're looking at is an increased number of folks experiencing homelessness in our community. And a lot of those folks will be turning to emergency camping outdoors because they may not have any other options, including sleeping on people's couches, going elsewhere, continuing to stay in the hotel motels, or going to a shelter because our shelters are, are at capacity right now. Um, I talked to Good Samaritan Haven, who is one of our sheltering partners, and they are bringing a lot of new places online. Um, they're working very hard to expand their shelter beds, and hopefully by the fall, they'll have over 80, 80 or over beds available for folks, which is a huge expansion on what we have available now. So there is a, 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 a solution, if you will, a short-term emergency solution for sh sheltering that's being expanded as we speak, but doesn't exist currently. So we created 
this policy to respond to both those legal responsibilities and for what we want staff to know what to do when they approach folks. So um, the policy itself is based on a local model from Hartford, Vermont. We worked very hard internally with a lot of staff from multiple departments who would be touched with it by this. And we also worked with our legal team with Hartford, Vermont, our homelessness task force, the cemetery commission, the rec advisory board, and I met with the parks commission last night. I do want to give you guys a report from the Parks Commission. They met, they asked to table their conversation to have a longer one this Thursday. And um, just for folks' awareness, they're meeting here in this room tomorrow at 6 p.m. And they voted to ask council to not take any formal action on this policy tonight, but just have a discussion until you can hear back from them. Okay, hold on. I don't know who that is. Okay, we're just gonna move on. Sorry, folks. All right. So, the proposed policy really makes sure that we're responding to the idea that it is okay to sleep on legal, or it's, I'm sorry. Emergency camping has been defined as legal on public land, and so it's necessary that we have a staff response to this. And so there's two major parts to this policy. A part that says where emergency camping and sleeping will be allowed if the shelters are full and a person has no other option. And that's the part that needs public, I'm sorry. This, <laughs> hold on. Connor, it was your computer. <laughs> All right, back again. Okay, so, um, so again, there's sort of two parts to this policy. There's one, which is where and how we um, sort of put boundaries around where people can camp, because the Martin versus Boise case that sets precedent for this really says that um, municipalities and jurisdictions are able to create boundaries over when and where people can camp as long as there's reasonable opportunities for them to camp elsewhere on public land. So that's the part that needs this public opinion, needs this public participation from all the folks sitting behind me and all the ones who've been participating since early June when we started this conversation with some of our commissions. So the other half of that policy is what staff is going to do if they encounter a camper or a sleeper or an abandoned campsite. That's going to still need to be internally established, no matter what council and our other elected bodies decide to do about putting up boundaries. So that's sort of the, the two parts of this policy. However, in general, this policy would, if adopted in whole, spell out what public land is available for emergency overnight sleeping, and then how staff will interact, interact with that. It also outlines high sensitivity areas that would not allow for camping, and then set up a staff response asking folks to relocate and how we would do that. Um, so the next slide really outlines where we've come up uh, with those high sensitivity areas where we would prohibit camping or sleeping. So this kind of came out of conversations with staff, with community members, with our committees, and our elected bodies like the Cemetery Commission. And the Parks Commission is being asked to weigh in on this list as well. So um, these were the boundaries that we we're asking council to help us examine. Um, the other properties that have been brought up for addition during those feedback sessions that I have not included here include the 12 main Moat lot. Um, I know that the Parks Commission has not weighed in, so I will not um, give any feedback about the parks locations that may or may not be added to this list. So just for folks who are listening in, this list is not formalized, this list is not um, don't take this for gospel. This is what we're proposing to council for feedback on. So having a policy like this in place protects both emergency, or emergency campers, the community, and the city, as it clearly explains what we expect from those who are emergency sleeping on public land if there's no other shelter available, and it communicates what we would call um, high sensitivity areas where we'd ask people to relocate. But it also holds the city to a standard, I think, when this is why I th this is so important to me to bring this policy mm -hmm. forward to council and to have it as a public discussion so that folks who would be impacted and those who are emergency sleeping know what standard they'll be approached by the city. I think it needs to be standardized because we've heard very much, like very strongly from our community that 
and even from our own police department, that that should not be the first answer and that should not be the first line of defense against folks who are just trying to sleep out of the elements, right? And so holding to that non-criminality mindset is very important to us as staff and we wanna ensure that that's sort of what is codified inside of policy so folks know what they can expect if they're camping in a place where we have asked them not to. So I've been rambling a lot, but what it comes down to really is the policy responds to a legal responsibility of jurisdictions after a case that has also been sort of um, aligned by our local state's attorney. It communicates our out and outlines our expectations to the staff and to the community. It reinforces the city's response to people who are already camping, because I cannot emphasize that enough that this is already happening and has been happening for a long time. It also makes sure that there's boundaries around where the city cannot support emergency sleeping and camping. What it doesn't do, however, um, is allow for camping for non-emergency reasons. I have a home in Montpelier. I cannot go camping in Montpelier because I have a place to go. If the shelters are open and there's a place for someone to go and they're camping in a high sensitivity area, we would ask them to leave that area so that they could go to a shelter that's more appropriate and safe. And it does not create permission for any illegal activity. If somebody is doing something illegal, we still ask that you call 911 and report that. So I talked a little bit earlier about how our state's attorney has made clarifying statements that align himself with sort of the ethos of the Martin v. Boise case. Um, he has stated that he's limiting the amount of infractions his office is willing to prosecute because he would like officers and police um, around the state to ensure that officers consider people's struggle with poverty and homelessness before they make citations. He's made it very clear that um, offenses such as minor property crimes, such as unlawful trespass, which is what this would be, are, are prevalent amongst those um, individuals and he would like us to take caution before citing folks for that. So he really also called out the importance of working with some of our uh, embedded uh, social service agent like our social service partner that we have in our police department to make sure that we are addressing these calls in a mindful way and not just citing folks. He also made it very clear that municipalities are, are likely to be forced into serving as systems of last resort to mitigate the suffering of folks. Oh no. Okay, there we go. This is fun for all of us. Um, and so he's, I guess I'll, I'll get to the point of this, is saying that like he wants to make sure that incarceration, he wants to make sure we know as cities and as um, cities that have police departments that incarceration and fines will only exacerbate the difficult circumstances of individuals who are facing homelessness, which is why a responsive policy such as the one we're proposing is the way that the city staff would like to go when we're responding to emergency sleepers. We would like it to be a discussion. We would like it to be a partnership with things like Washington County Mental Health or our peer support outreach worker, which is super important for us as the city uh, in partnership with Good Samaritan Haven to really address folks where they're at and meet them where they're at and make sure we are not criminalizing um, homelessness. So I'm gonna sort of take a, a step back and sort of respond to some community feedback and questions that I've gotten as I've spoken to folks about this policy. So does this allow any resident to camp on public land? I would say no. The city's responsibility is to allow sleeping on specific public land if no shelter space is available. So again, if you have a place to stay or a shelter is available, that does not allow for emergency camping. So we also talked a little bit with the Parks Department or the Parks Commission yesterday about how this will impact park participation. And um, again, I, I think it's important, and I think this conversation that's come out of this proposal has been really interesting, because I think it's bringing awareness to the fact, for the first time for a lot of folks, that people have been camping on public land. Um, we might not see them, which is why it's, it's less of a thing that's reported. Um, I, our park staff has reported seeing very little folks, um, I think one or two in the last year, because people are trying to stay out of the way, but it has been and there will, I think, probably always be a population of folks who need to stay in tents um, because they don't have any other option. And so then I would always just say, make sure that if you have dogs that are loose in the park, just make sure they're under verbal control. And again, if you have 
if you see illegal activity, please report that to the police. So some other questions that have come up are some issues is does this adequately address hygiene concerns for those who are out there emergency sleeping? And definitely not. It does not do that, nor does it purport to solve that problem. Um, this does, however, sort of talk about um, outlining mitigation strategies. Just remember, folks, if you're on Zoom, please mute yourself. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, and we know that public facilities are limited in hours and locations throughout the city, and we are looking to the literally just formed Public Restroom Committee for recommendations on that issue. Um, I've also heard that this policy doesn't do anything to address the root causes of homelessness, and we agree that it doesn't. The only aim of this policy is to outline how staff should address emergency campsites found on public land that city owned. So again, I sort of talked about this a little bit earlier, but those high sensitivity areas that we're asking council to sort of help us work out um, and the community to help us work out um, was really um, taken into account through our staff and through community partners, our committees, and um, our legal team. So another question I've gotten is why even do this at all? Why not have no policy? Why are we even talking about this? I would argue that if we don't have an internal policy for at least addressing folks who are emergency camping or emergency sleeping, the staff, our staff doesn't have any direction on how to address it. Um, also, if we don't develop an internal policy or boundaries around where we would like folks to camp or not camp, it would still be um, uh, enforceable under the Martin v. Boise case if that decides to be tried in our area and those things would already be happening like the things like people emergency sleeping on city owned land is already happening and it would still be happening and so this is a bad map that is of course not in frame so uh, there are copies of this online and if you need a physical copy I can get this to you but note this is a draft and we are working on a nicer one with the Planning Commission um, that right now this is what this looks like. If you did not take out anything from the list of high sensitivity areas, this is what remains as public land that would be appropriate for emergency sleeping if no other shelter was available. So I, because it's a draft and because this hasn't been approved, I'm not going to go through them one by one, but I want you to see what that looks like. And I also kind of want to note, and I think this is going to be important for the public restroom committee to talk about, is how far away city-owned land is from things like amenities. So our next steps, which I think are very important, um, and the policy passing or not does not preclude us from taking any of these steps, is to continue work with our community partners. We've funded a peer outreach worker through Good Samaritan Haven through 2023, and I think that that's a huge step for us and very important. Um, I want to call out the work that Don Little is doing. I think she's been a godsend for us and does a lot of work, um, and I appreciate all the time she puts into that. We would continue work with the Washington County Homelessness Action Team, which is looking to form a sort of hub where um, folks can go if they need to receive wraparound services, so that's their goal. Um, they're working towards that, and we're here to support them through that. We'd like to receive for support and guidance through our Homelessness Task Force and the new Public Restroom Committee to address those underlying issues of hygiene. The City Council had appropriated uh, funding for two years for the Homelessness Task Force, and that's something they're currently working on um, creating po uh, um, priority lists for, for y'all's consideration. Uh, we'd also like to, and I think this is an important part and an important note here, is seeking clarity from the state on how they're going to be addressing emergency camping on their land and advocating for more state funding and services to support those who are experiencing homelessness. I will say that a lot of folks have been put out of the shelters that they did have through the state and the hotel motel program that don't have anywhere to go and don't feel like they're supported in services. Um, from the state. Oh, also, there is a ton of state-owned land in Montpelier that currently does not have a plan. Um, you know, I've been told anecdotally that people are already being asked to move off of that space, and where does that leave them? So it's something that we need clarity for, and we can certainly ask someone from the state to brief counsel in the community on what the state is doing to support those who are experiencing homelessness. And so 
My recommendation um, was to approve this proposed policy so staff in the community have an understanding of how we'd be in um, addressing emergency encampments or uh, emergency sleeping, but the Parks Commission has asked for um, just a continued conversation, and I think that's also important. And so, um, you know, I'm also fine and here to hear feedback from both the community and the council about this issue. Um, I want to also thank everyone for being super engaged and um, having thought-provoking conversation about this issue. I think it's been eye-opening for a lot of folks on both sides of the conversation. Um, and also I want to invite you to the Homelessness Task Force, which meets every other Wednesday in Zoom or in person from 1130 to 1 if you want to continue the conversation with us um, outside of this venue. Uh, the next meeting is August 4th. So that's my presentation to y'all. While the mayor is coming back, I'd like to add a couple more comments to, to Cameron's. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm talking right into the mic here. I'm assuming Rob will take care of that in a second. Um, so I'd like to just add a couple more comments. Thank you, Cameron, for that excellent uh, presentation. Um, there have been a lot of comments made, and uh, many of them directed at Cameron. And I want to be clear that this is a policy that our whole team worked on. She, uh, Cameron, is our liaison to the Homelessness Task Force. And um, I asked her to do this. This is not uh, her agenda, and I want to make that clear as people talk about things. Um, she's certainly done a fine job in that, but our whole department head team uh, has, has recommended this. I don't, uh, and for the reasons she gave, there's been some changes. First of all, um, as she said, this has been happening already. Second of all, we've had a, a pandemic, and now people have been let out of hotels and no real transition plan from the state to deal with it. Third of all, we've heard from this, the uh, state's attorney about how he wants to see cases handled and not criminalized. And there is the Boise case. So those are all things that have caused us to look at this issue and say to the city council and to the public, this is something that needs to be talked about. And uh, we can't just stick our head under the sand and ignore that this is happening. Um, lastly, I want to note that um, we're talking about people, that these are, these are folks that are, are unhoused, that are living in uh, great challenging circumstances. And sleeping is, uh, is what we're talking about. Um, there are many legal things that people can do. They can stand, they can sit in benches, they can be in Hubbard Park, and they can do that for many hours of the day. Those are, not, uh, those are things that can happen now. They're not talked about in this policy. And I think many of the comments that I've heard have uh, associated certain behaviors and attempted to identify, to, uh, to s sort of spread that to all people who need to sleep at night, and that just is inappropriate. Um, people need, they don't have a place to be home. People that are standing, uh, Mr. Whitaker mentioned Garden Park. Those people may or may not be camping at night. They're sitting there doing things that are, you know, maybe not good. Um, but that doesn't mean necessarily that they're the population. So, you know, I understand people have fears, and it's important to hear from them. Um, but the folks we're talking about also have pretty severe needs, and I ask that we um, remember that they're human and keep that in our minds as we're talking about this. Great. Thank you. Uh, so moving into the next uh, part of this, um, I so because uh, the Parks Commission has asked us to uh, hold off on, on a decision, I, I could picture us uh, potentially, I, I'm game to, to hear from you all, your thoughts on this as well. Uh, I mean, I could picture us moving forward with, this, uh, with a potential vote on this policy absent the high sensitivity areas. Um, but it's also possible that the Parks Commission may want to weigh in on the other parts as well. Um, and so I, I'll, I'll leave it to us as to uh, whether or not we want to take up the rest of it, but I'd recommend that we at least not vote on the um, high sensitivity areas portion of it tonight. Um, the opinion of the Parks Commission matters a, a great deal to me, and I, I think that uh, it may matter to other folks as well. Um, but having said that, the way uh, I picture this uh, portion of the item going, of uh, this agenda item going, is I want to start by hearing from the public. I know uh, probably uh, many of you would like to uh, offer a comment on this, and so now would be the time to do that. 
Uh, once we ha hear from the public, then the council will have a discussion about, um, you know, having heard from folks um, what our thoughts are and, and where we might want to go next. Um, so uh, again, if you, th so thank you again, Cameron, uh, for your presentation. Um, if folks want, uh, would like to make a comment, if you would uh, say your name, where you live, and um, try to keep your comments brief. I'll, I'll just say that for now, because I suspect that we may have a lot of uh, folks who uh, may want to comment on this. Um, do you want things? folks on Zoom to go first, or folks in the room? That is, you know what? Mm. I actually think that I, I would prefer to have folks in person go first. Mm -hmm. Once that has run out, then we'll transition to folks who are remote. Have people already started raising their hands? Yes, and okay. uh, folks on Zoom, it'd be great if you did raise your hand. If you go under the reactions button at the bottom, uh, there is a raise hand function, and so that we can put you in a queue. Okay. Thank you. That would be great. Um, we already have um, a hand here. If uh, if you would like to um, make a comment, I welcome you up uh, here. And then um, if you would like to um, add something after, uh, or whoever is speaking now, I would recommend just forming a, a line over there by the table is my recommendation. Hello, everybody. Hello, I'm, yes, go ahead. I'm Jamie Swan. Um, I currently live up at the O'Connell Lodge. I've been um, homeless off and on since I was 15. I, have a video on YouTube of Barry Homeless on with over 8,700 views. If anybody wants to pay attention a little bit about what goes on with the homeless, but um, the, the letting the homeless people camp, I, th I think. Oh. Sorry, hang on one it's second. All right. Okay, I think we're good. Sorry about I, that. I think if we had a designated area for people to camp, the reason they're so scattered is we don't have a designated area and, and they're in fear of getting in trouble. So they, they go everywhere and they scatter everywhere and personally they, they make a big mess. I've been homeless for a long time and without proper bathrooms and stuff and they have to go, they, they make a mess and I don't properly like seeing all that stuff and if we had a designated area you know, like some towns Burlington do, it, it would give them an area to have bathrooms, restrooms, porta potties, you know, proper washing facilities and, and to we could police each other and help each other to kind of pick up things and, and keep things clean and, and organized but right now we don't really have that and the, you know people got soft with this hotel thing you know they, they got put in hotels and you got looked after for a long time and now there's a lot of fear going on about what, what to do and a lot of people I, I understand that you know as long as you, you say as long as there's proper place to go like the shelter a lot of people have fear of going to the shelter a lot of people just won't go to the shelter because they fear they have I, I have any social disease disorder it's not the best thing for me to put me in a bunch of people it's it's really not so you know I I'll go to the woods first I, I I've got a camp built in Mount Pleasure that I built years back I got a camp in Berlin that I built it's two windows wood stove and a door you know it's we do what we have to do out there. We, you think that we're just going to go and camp somewhere for a night's sleep. You say sleep, and then we're going to go and hang out in the park all day. And no, we want a home too. And we don't necessarily have it, and we'll go build it. We'll, we'll put it somewhere, you know. And that's why you don't see a lot of us because we hide it. We we, we camouflage our areas and stay away so we don't get in trouble because of the fear we have of police showing up. And you know, we, we're just trying to live. That's all we want to do. We we don't have everything that everybody else has out there. You know, but we can get by. We really can, but, you know, the fear that most of us have of getting in trouble is not, not a pleasant thing. You know, you give us these rooms and people look down on us and stuff. You know, the hotel, you think these hotels are comfortable? But they do. They look down on us, and it's, it's not a good feeling. It's, it's really not. You know, we, we appreciate everything that they've given us. We do, but it's not the best of things for some people. It's not. You know, but I, I just feel it would be better if you designated a place for most of them to go to look after each other than, than let them scatter and make messes all over the place. You know, I, I helped build the fitness course through Hubbard Park. I was the first one to help cut it through with a school project back in seventh grade. And I don't want to see that park get messed up. You know, if you put it maybe back at seven fireplaces, old spot, you know, where you had a porta potty or something to, to take care of them, you know, but don't let them just scatter everywhere. They'll mess up everything. They will. I'm, 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 I hate to say it, but they will. They will make messes everywhere. All of a sudden, they'll have housing somewhere, and they won't care about their tents, their camps, everything. They'll walk away from it, and they'll leave it right there, and it's it's wrong. It is. I, I hate to see it. And 
it's just part of it. Some of them ruin it for, for the rest of us, you know. But if we're together, we can pick up that stuff. We can get it done. But right now, we don't we don't have that that safety. You know, so that's a, about what I got to say about that. Thank you, Jamie. You got to give us some place to go. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. God yeah, I appreciate that. Other uh, comments? I'm on the oh. Sorry, I'm just making sure everyone on Zoom is muted so we don't have any other intera interruptions. You can go now. Go ahead. Uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Uh, I've studied this extensively. I've attended a couple of meetings of the ta Homelessness Task Force on this and a meeting last night at, of the Parks Commission. Uh, the draft policy, to quote the late great Whitney Parker from Baldwin Street, ass in two, it's upside down. Uh, the foundation of any sound policy that truly intends to be compassionate and uh, uh, supportive would be the sanitation, uh, toilets and showers uh, in small clusters. I support the comments made by the earlier, uh, the person just before me. Uh, small clusters distributed uh, Peace Park, Gateway Park, uh, North Branch Park, so that no more than 10 or 12 people are, are gathered they can self-govern as far as the noise, the quiet time. Uh, a supervisor should really be hired to keep the peace and know when to call for help. Uh, toilet trailers. Every site should have a flush toilet trailer. Uh, those should be procured with ARPA money and they, well maintained, can last 10 or 20 years for other emergencies. Shower trailers could be less frequently uh, distributed as long as there's a way to get to them. Uh, the Parks Commission did indicate from the conversation, and I would encourage you to watch the ORCA video, uh, that they intended to do due diligence, uh, no pun intended. Uh, they do not have the capacity to pick up uh, the trash and the due, uh, so to speak. Uh, they do not have the capacity to mow or pick up the trash in Confluence Park or to power wash uh, Girton Park uh, right now. Um, so they were much more realistic about the need to preserve Hubbard Park uh, and how quickly this could get out of control. Uh, social paths breaking off the ranks of the official paths, et cetera. Uh, due diligence, housing, homelessness task force, not so much. Uh, when we attempted before the special meeting last week to get the sanitation uh, needs on the agenda, it was skipped and dropped off the end of the meeting. It similar was on course for the same today uh, when I left. Um, the definition of high sensitivity areas is arbitrary, arbitrarily narrow. Um, we say we're, no one can be in the floodplain, yet we allow our police department and fire department to be in the floodplain. Uh, floodplain, even the memo from Mike Miller, which I received in a public records request did not rule out uh, homeless folks being able to camp in the floodplain. Uh, when I mention the clusters, I believe that I, I think that we should invest in the little huts, the Conestoga huts. I've shared this before because they are secure against uh, theft and assault. There's a locking door. There's a steel uh, framework of reinforcing wire that prevents someone from attacking someone in their sleep, which is one of the fears that I think guided this, is fear of somebody getting rolled with their $2,500. Um, ruling out the multi-use paths, the floodplain, 50 feet from a private, I mean, we're just inviting a challenge, a, a legal challenge. Similarly, the policy fails to address what are the rights of someone who's being displaced from a, a, a camp uh, to appeal. Uh, to attempt to get an injunction so they can't have their camp torn down or put into storage. Uh, there's no provision for that addressed here. There's no provision for folks in the bus and campers and, and car campers. Um, I, I'm aware that false information was uh, shared about state law on car camping by one of our uh, esteemed officers 
uh, sarcastically delivered. Uh, so this is somewhat of a bluff, that we're going to bluff the folks into being anxious about where they can and can't be, and we're going to narrow down the allowable sites down to where out of sight, out of mind, can't see it from my house. Um, the, oh, nothing on a small cluster of designated camping. Okay, designated camping sites with trash and sanitary facilities with nearby walking paths to the, some folks, as again, the prior witness said, are going to want to have more privacy, not be in a cluster. But I believe that folks will uh, appreciate and honor the value of uh, proximity to facilities, uh, although some will need to be further away. I'm almost done. Uh, non-involvement. This pretends to be a non-involvement uh, policy, but yet it has anybody who finds anybody reporting it to the city manager and the police chief. And then as soon as they decide to do an invasion, they're going to, Washington County Mental Health is there. So not only are we the poo, and then we're going to come and look and see where you're pooping, because that's our first reason to throw you out. And that's because we didn't write the policy right and take care of the sanitation at the, at the get-go. So this is not a non-intrusion in, non, uh, or a, uh, I forget the word used. Um, folks do not want to be mapped, do not want to be reported to the police. They don't want to be uh, tracked. Uh, but if you make it easy for folks to take care of their hygiene needs, uh, you'll make it simpler. Um, Everyone is not a mental case. So the, the inclu inclusion of Washington County Mental Health really offended folks that I was talking to over at Curtin Park this afternoon. Um, Parks Commission is considering Gateway Park uh, as an option of where to put the, the dedicated dog park. Um, it prompted the comment last night that in Montpelier, dogs get better treatment than the homeless humans. Um, that's enough. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. I uh, hope people can hear me through my mask. My name is Seth Collins. I live in Berlin, Vermont. And uh, pretty much everything I wanted to say was covered. But I would like to uh, reinforce uh, something involving some little uh, armored huts or something. I, I think to move in the direction of, of tiny houses, uh, to start off with, it was some some like collect or uh, like some sort of shared bathhouse with those tiny houses around it. To move in the direction of tiny houses with full facilities would be a, a good next step. But this certainly this certainly is a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Hi everyone, I'm Vanessa Brown. I live on Northfield Street. Um, also closer to the mic, Vanessa. Yeah. Okay. Hey. I live on Northfield Street. Um, I'm also a member of the bar and um, have a, a history of homelessness. Um, and want to say that when these issues came up over Front Porch Forum, I was re-traumatized by the extremely judgmental and dehumanizing comments that I heard towards other people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, <clears throat> I want to share also about the voucher program and my experience talking to people who have been on the voucher program during the voucher program. And I'd like to say that it's somewhat of a myth that um, it was stable for the people who were on the program. Um, it, there are many instances where they were um, losing vouchers for unknown reasons, uh, for reasons unrelated to behavior. Um, they were um, put into housing, uh, told they had a voucher, 
working with the Pathways folks, working with other agencies, uh, and would re receive eviction letters. Meanwhile, the landlords would be continuing to collect rent. Uh, it, um, really dehumanizing. Uh, I've seen a lot of people, when they see someone who is presenting as uh, poor or perhaps ill, uh, they are not treated well by other members of the public. Um, and, you know, I shared a poem uh, that uh, a young person uh, wrote who has been in and out of this system, uh, 22 years old. I just wanted to share it here tonight. It's called Fall. Uh, she says, Fall, he, excuse me, Fall is a friend of mine, one of the kindly kind. Whispers of it in the woods, following the kids with our hoods. Secrets we keep hidden inside. Secrets we keep keeping us blind. Wherever I go, I keep your pen in my pocket. Wherever you go, I hope you're keeping my locket. Hand on my heart, your heart in my head. Wherever you go, I hope you sleep in a bed. Kids with hoods, they're ready to go. Where they're going, hell only knows. Play it by ear, listen clearly, my dear. Fall comes again once every year. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm not currently a resident of Montpelier. That's okay. Okay. I'm in Barrie one more week, and then I will be living in my car. So, uh, which I'm going to write about, I hope, to the Times Argus, but we'll see. Would you share your name first for the record? Oh, Mary Messier. Thank you. Um, so I recently, um, about two months ago, I wrote to the Homeless Task Force with uh, about a company that I found through the internet while I was exploring tiny houses, which is kind of my um, enjoyment of looking at them and, and et cetera. And they're called uh, Pallet Shelter Company. And they are doing wonderful work in this area of homeless um, needs. So what they do is they build tiny modular shelter. They can put up a building in two hours because it's modular. Um, they work with municipalities to have wraparound services. It, it just looks amazing. I've read some of their site. Uh, I've called them. They ship six uh, units at a time, 6000 each, $6,000 each, each one. I think they could set up in some areas, like for instance, maybe they set up like 50 of these or 20. I don't know all the specifics. Uh, so I, I sent that information to the Homeless Task Force a couple months ago. Then I posted it on Front Porch Forum. And um, today I was trying to send that information to the governor. I, I sent it to Ann Watson. Um, I think it's great because they're working. This is what they do. They hire homeless individuals. Uh, I think it's really great, and we're going to need this no matter what happens, um, seeing there's climate change, there's emergencies. I was in the Irene flood. That was an emergency. My house uh, was destroyed. Um, you know, there's many things coming down the pike we need to have a source of shelter that can be invested in when you need it. And also, it sounds like this can, you know, if they ship six at a time, you know, these can be stored. I would think uh, what my suggestion was, or idea was that each uh, large municipality, say like Rutland, Burlington, White River, Mont Central Vermont, you know, that the state could invest in places somehow, I don't know, lease or buy, land area, and these can be set up and for emergency shelter use. 
and they're engineered and designed for this purpose. That's all been worked into this company, the Pallet Shelter Company. Um, I sent Anne the information and I also have posted that again on Front Porch Forum today. Um, so I just think they're really, I think they really know what they're doing. And this would be great because sometimes um, when people are all in one big building, I think kind of problems can get exacerbated. And this is so that, you know, a person could be in their house by themselves, <clears throat> they can lock the door. Um, and I think what they do is they set up with whatever site they're going to do, they set up a community bathhouse. Um, you know, you really, really would need to look on the site to get all the specifics. I don't have all the specifics. But they, they've done, a, I think they've done a lot of these. I, I, I would just guess from looking at the map, and I didn't study it, probably about 15 major areas in the United States. Um, I think Texas, California, maybe Michigan or, or Minnesota. And um, so I've sent the information out, and I really hope that something like this can be done, and, and along with other ideas, the tiny houses and the, uh, you know, there's just so many uh, possibilities, and not one size is going to fit all. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Ken Russell, uh, Homelessness Task Force. Um, that previous comment is really wonderful, and it's the, the sort of thing that I'm, I, I'm seeing right now a lot of you know, very engaged discussion on these issues. Um, we endorsed this policy knowing it was a work in progress, knowing that the Parks Commission hadn't weighed in yet, knowing that we need a big community-wide discussion on this, and, and it takes all of us to solve this problem. We've worked really hard in many areas, but our, our capacity is limited. So having um, people coming out saying, we don't want this, but why don't we do this, and or, this isn't good enough, this is what we really need. We really do need to be, build collective will to do something really innovative. Like, it would be great if the city would issue an RFP on city land to build something like she, what she's describing and somebody figure out the funding for this. So um, I do want to um, acknowledge the hard work that the city has done on this policy. Um, Cameron is, um, taken a lot of input, been able to incorporate it. It hasn't made everybody happy. Um, the, the thing about Washington County being the, you know, the, the responser, the responder, um, we'd like to see a, a broader group respond. Um, but overall, it, it's, it's heartening to see folks affirm behavior that's already happening, setting a tone that folks can live in this jurisdiction, that human lives do matter. Um, but there's, it's a work in progress, and uh, you know, and to do justice to this conversation doesn't always fall into a, 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 a format of a few meetings. So, anyway, um, thank you for your good work. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Before we have people go again, I also want to let folks who are online go, and then we can see about if um, there's an opportunity for for any. Um, Repeats. Anyone who has not, who's here, who has not spoken yet, like to share a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Hi there, Hi. Kathy Partlow, and I live in Northfield, but I work here in Montpelier at the Family Center of Washington County. I manage our homelessness programming. And uh, we work, as you might imagine, with pregnant and parenting families. Um, so some of those folks, I will say, choose to be camping in their cars or camping elsewhere versus being in these hotels. If you've watched any of the news, you know that sometimes these ho hotels can feel a little less than safe for folks. Um, and while that's being worked on, it can be really difficult for families with uh, young children or children in general. 
So what I want to say just briefly is that we are so encouraged that you are taking this step and that you are thinking so um, holistically about this problem and acknowledging that folks who are experiencing homelessness are people in your community, uh, that they exist here and that you need to really be thinking about how they are going to exist here because they are not going away regardless of whether you put the policy in effect or not. So uh, we just want to say we thank you for that. And if you uh, need to partner with us anymore, we're happy to do so. Thank you. All right, anyone else who is not, who's here, who has not yet uh, spoken? Okay, um, Cameron, can I ask you to facilitate uh, uh, folks who are uh, online who have either their hands raised or who, um, yeah, of course, or who, yeah, so who want to speak. Folks, um, again, just use a reaction button and say raise hand, or you can physically wave. Um, I see Morgan's hand is raised. And so, Cameron, I'm, I'm going to let you just call on people since you're running. Can do. Okay. Morgan, go for it. Oh, hold on. I'm going to move so I can see better. Okay, Morgan, sorry. Morgan, I had yeah. turned the wall volume down, so now we're good. Okay. Morgan Brown, resident of District 3. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Good. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to request, I know you're doing sort of a public comment period right now, but I would like to request that before the city council considers voting on this, that there be a uh, two-hour, at least one two-hour public hearing held before making any decision on the policy. Uh, secondly, on page seven of the policy, um, can I, can I put one of these about the speaker? Washington yeah. County Mental Health references on, on contact, um, I have a real major problem with that. And, not speaking for anybody else, but I've heard others as well. And I'd like to see that uh, change. And, you know, Washington County Mental Health could be on a on a uh, menu, a list of social service agencies that, you know, can, uh, uh, can be referred to uh, if a person's interested, but it should be voluntary and it shouldn't be uh, automatic you know, we're, we're sick in uh, a mental health agency on, on people and assuming, you know, that their problem can be solved by Washington County Mental Health and all. Uh, next, disposal of property. Right now it says 30 days. Uh, I've been asking that it needs to be at least 90 days and maybe 120 days, but definitely at least 90, not 30. Uh, on the 72 hours where a camp is found and considered abandoned or whatever, uh, that's not enough time. There's many cases where, you know, a person might not be able to get back there. And this has already been spoken about, but I would uh, second that. Uh, I would think that what needs to happen is the ordinance on uh, not camping, um, you know, in the parks needs to be revisited. And I would urge you to consider revisiting it and amending it so that uh, emergency uh, camping for those that have no other choice, you know, uh, be allowed. And that would help solve this in a lot of ways. Uh, so please consider that. And uh, I, I agree with Stephen Whitaker on the appeals. I think there needs to be an appeal process. So I urge you to consider that. And, you know, I heard uh, one of the speakers mentioning about how a front porch forum, they found just some terrible stuff, you know, about the people we're talking about. And it goes beyond maybe not in my backyard. <laughs> It's nope, not on planet Earth. And I had one last thing I wanted to 
if you give me a moment. Sorry for the emotion. It's okay, we'll I would like to read a poem. Our home is the garden of life. Let people find a place where they can plant fertile seeds that contain their own hopes and dreams from which they may then draw harvests of plenty to share with others in which they will call home. For it is a garden where lives thrive and are grown. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Jose? Thank you. I just, uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the, you know, the hard work that's been put in by the city and um, all the resources that have been applied to this and people you know, really putting out their heart. I think everyone wants to come to a, um, a point at which we're treating people with dignity and we're moving this community forward in, in, in a positive direction. Um, having said that, I think that um, as you have heard, more and more people uh, present their their experiences in, with homelessness and um, their experience as professionals working with these communities. You know, there's there's probably work to be done on, on this proposal. I would uh, encourage you to continue, even though the state has, you know, provided, uh, is, is providing $2,500 and is providing up to $8,000, all these various things, that you continue leaning on the state because I do feel that this situation has come about um, because of a policy that was well-intentioned that has uh, come to an end and has, um, you know, put you in a very uh, difficult uh, situation. So I, I would say that if you can um, continue putting pressure on them and also looking at what we have, which is, um, you know, faith communities, various nonprofits and organizations to not just partner with them and, you know, and lean on them a bit, but to figure out ways to help them because they have so much experience already doing this. You know, you, as you know, uh, meals are provided in town by various churches. There is, um, you know, a whole number of nonprofits, some who have already spoken, uh, who are involved. So, you know, to sort of um, take all that into consideration and maybe uh, hopefully we can, uh, obviously we have this deadline coming up and it's gonna be difficult, but uh, we can come up with some sort of comprehensive plan that, um, it's better than what we have now. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Next, we have Alex. Hi. Hello? We can see it. Hey, hey, my name is Alex. I live in the building. I uh, have a few uh, s sections, kind of three, like a, a kind of grouped my comments into three smaller sections. And I, I want to start from acknowledging that we all come from a point where we are concerned about well-being of the people who found themselves in a homeless situation. And uh, I hope that none of what I'm saying will be interpreted as a criticism. My problem is with the implementation, not with what we are doing. And uh, so first is I wanted to find out uh, like what have we done to see what uh, what can be done to avoid even uh, becoming uh, a subject to the boys in the sense that like, we can have we reached out to Montpelier churches to see if they, maybe they can temporarily house uh, some of the people who need places uh, to sleep at? Like, what have we done to see uh, what else could be done other than uh, immediately falling back on the Boise law case says we need to open the woods. So uh, have we also researched what uh, if has something similar been done elsewhere in the country and what were their, their outcomes? Is, uh, or are we the first ones uh, that we know about who, who are doing this? So uh, the second section is obviously like are we putting people that uh, like are we trading uh, one set of risks uh, for a different one? Like in the forest, we have uh, ticks, uh, we have a lack of uh, easy medical access, uh, and no sanitation. Uh, like if somebody is experiencing an, an OD, it's difficult to even know that it's going on. Uh, so just, and th third, uh, look, it has been said that uh, we know we're not sending a message that Montpelier is open for anyone to uh, come uh, and 
camp. So here we are talking about maps, uh, about critic, uh, uh, zones that are sensitive, zones that are not, places where, where it's possible to camp, places where it's not possible to camp. So are they expecting everyone to have a smartphone and go on the internet to read about it? Probably not. So does it mean that we are going to have a map somewhere at the entrance of the park? I don't see how else it can work. So, and if we have a map at the entrance of the park, how is it anything but an invitation? And the uh, last part I have is uh, uh, we need to uh, weight the uh, Boise, uh, pot the potential liability of a Boise case versus introducing new liabilities for the city. And uh, by introducing, the, let's say, the maps, uh, are, are we saying that city will be taking the responsibility for every wildfire that starts uh, from having people camping in the woods. What if adjacent homes burn, and uh, even worse, if somebody dies in the wildfire, in the fire as a result? Uh, like, since we're going from uh, like status quo to explicit uh, policy that says, yes, you can do it. So does it put us in, uh, does it make the city liable for the damage to those homes or to the park? Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Anybody else on Zoom uh, if they'd like to speak? You can uh, physically wave your hand, you could raise your hand, you could make an emoji pop up, you could do a lot of things to get my attention. Uh, Peter Kelman. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Peter Kelman, I live in District 3. Um, I, I just uh, I, I want to say how impressed I am by the process that the city council, that Cameron and the uh, city manager uh, have taken, and on the comments that we've heard from a very wide range of people, some of whom have experience, direct experience in this area, others who are professionals. And all of this is in stark contrast to some of the very disturbing comments that have been spread on Front Porch Forum. I wish that the city council would look at this as a great example of how to take on some of these issues. Um, I've before pointed to the way my ride uh, has been developed in a similar way. Going out and finding the people who are affected, starting with a philosophy of do no harm. And this is one of the reasons why I have been so disturbed by the way the energy information ordinance slipped through without this kind of very important conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. All right, Carrie Brown. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I just kind of want to echo the, the thanks and the appreciation to all of you for the thought and the diligence that you've put into developing this policy. Um, it, it makes me feel really proud of Montpelier and, and really proud of uh, being a part of the city where we are, <sighs> we're really trying to think about our neighbors and um, how we take care of each other. And I am also really impressed by the, the various ideas that I've heard come up as people are talking about, well, you know, maybe we could try this, maybe we could try that. And um, I, it's really inspirational to me that there are, there's so much energy for thinking about ways that we can be thinking about longer term solutions, which is really what we need to do and ways to get people into more permanent housing. And so I'm, um, you know, I know that this is all being recorded and, and you're all, everybody's taking notes and I, I'm very encouraged by that. I assume this will all be, you know, the homelessness task force will be thinking about this and all of our, our housing committees and um, that we can take some of this energy that to, uh, to go towards long-term solutions while at the same time recognizing that right now we have people who need some place to stay and we need to treat them with compassion and we need to treat them with respect and, um, 
we need to to try to help them have as high quality of life as everybody who lives in Montpelier should deserve. Thanks. Thank you, Carrie. All right, is there anyone else on Zoom who would like to speak up? You can just unmute yourself, raise your hand, whatever you want to do. Fair, I'm not seeing anyone else. Okie dokie. Vanessa, right? Yeah, if you have something else you want to add, go ahead. Hi, thanks for hearing me again. And, um, and uh, yeah, hold on a second here. There we yeah. go. Thanks. Thanks for hearing me again. Um, you know, yeah, thanks and praise. I, you know, no one had mentioned the Martin case on Front Porch Forum, and so it was a surprise to me when I saw it uh, in the policy. Um, you know, uh, what was going through my mind when I was looking at it um, was mainly around sleep. Um, so, um, you know, I'm just, you know, running through the scenario. I'm trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to know what the highly sensitive area is? You know, uh, the point is sleep being a human need, and oftentimes people are distressed, exhausted. It, maybe they've gotten into a fight with somebody else during the day that's they want to go find a safe place to be. Being woken up, are, are people going to be wake identifying people and asking them questions in the middle of the night about whether they have, a, a, you know, shelter? You know, so it's like thinking about, you know, folks like, you know, folks in town can't camp, right? Who have homes. So I'm thinking about that, and then just how do we, how are we, how are people being sorted? And the sorting seems a little kind of strange to me. I hope it's not happening in the middle of the night. Um, uh, I also hope that um, other residents, you know, if I'm sleeping, I'm homeless, I, you know, kind of want to be asleep at night. So not feeling like I want people to approach me at night when I'm sleeping. And Martin case is a lot about sleeping. So sleep, sleep, sleep. Please let people sleep. Um, and, um, I guess that was really it, just clarity around what these vague, highly sensitive areas might be. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead, Mary. Um, I just wanted to briefly say on my idea about that company, that is kind of a um, in between building a big, a big new ho uh, house or what's going on now, I'm not really in the loop. Um, I don't know all the details about um, the camping around town that's being um, discussed. I don't know everything about it, but I hope it does come out good for people and people need to be able to, you know, have that place to lay down and be comfortable. But uh, uh, I wasn't uh, for or against the uh, where you can sleep in town. I don't know enough about it right now, but I'm trying to learn what's going on. I was out of the loop for a little while in town. I lived here five years and i um, <laughs> trying to get back into town, but uh, housing is the worst I've ever seen it for finding a place. So anyways, I just wanted to speak to that, that my idea wasn't uh, on this particular Hubbard Park or, or that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. I'll try to be even briefer this time. Um, the failure to address state-owned lands, uh, which are equally applicable in the context of the Martin v. Boise case, uh, is a uh, glaring omission, especially in that Montpelier police resources and, and social services, city manager, public works, et cetera, would all necessarily need to be involved in any such intervention. So that fundamentally needs to be addressed because the state-owned lands are some of the most uh, attractive and are currently being used uh, as campsites. Um, the undue burden on churches. I don't. I think we underestimate the 
burden that we put or that we expect the churches to step up to because the city has not heretofore wrestled with these issues. Um, I think it's an issue, these are government issues and it's high time and I'm glad to see the council. I believe that this meeting is making evident that the council needs to be involved uh, because after two years the homelessness task force has not gotten to where we need to get and now it's emergency level. Um, the fires uh, is going to be a real issue. I think there's only a few sites that I mentioned. I forgot to mention Home Farm Road, even though the title is ambiguous. Um, but that that's an ideal site uh, because there's water and sewer capacity there. There's agricultural jobs available there. Um, the dignity of work and the investment and opportunity to give folks a, a ladder up from this situation is really the part of the design. We need a strategic plan that includes uh, all these factors. And I, I don't know where, who you're gonna rely on to get that plan, but it's, it's long overdue and it's urgent. Um, with regard to the sorted, I did mention site coordinators at each of these small clusters. Uh, the advantage of a $2,000 hut is it's an incentive for someone to agree to abide by rules. Since they have the right to camp on public land, there's nothing you can take away from them. You know, if they fail to, if they want to create fights or make noise all night, etc. If somebody has a hut, that's, that's a privilege. Um, the hut uh, is secure, the hut or the pallet shelter. I think the huts are a little more attractive physically, but you know. Um, also having engagement from the site coordinators with Washington County Mental Health if necessary and or even the police department if necessary to create the right mix of folks at, at the various clusters. You can't put all the teetotaler drunks at one and expect there not to be uh, problems. So by creating a, uh, a healthy mix of folks at various sites. How are you going to do that, Steve? I wouldn't do it. I would rely on experts. <laughs> I mean, are we going to have breathalyzers as we as they no, come in? No, it's, that's what Good Sam does. Uh, but no, I think the, uh, I'm not saying behavior oriented, but temperament wise and, and some people want to go to bed early, some people have kids, whatever. But I'm suggesting that the site coordinators with some surrounding so social services could uh, find the right mix of folks to use the different clusters is, is what I'm saying. Uh, we're getting into more detail than we have time for tonight. I didn't intend to. I wanted to plant the seed and invite further discussion. Um, yeah, creating opportunities as so as apartments become available, which might be years from now, uh, and or tiny homes or whatever. Tiny homes with land and plumbing is, is a multi-year investment. Uh, in design and engineering. So we need emergency uh, pl without plumbing, shared plumbing facilities. We need emergency facilities that are safe and quiet and restful and distributed. That's, that's enough. Thank Thanks. you. And just to check in again with the folks online, is there anyone? Uh, yeah, Alex, uh, go ahead. Yeah, sir. I I forgot to mention one tiny part uh, from yesterday's meeting at the Parks uh, Commission. I do not know Something has been mentioned that uh, we already have had cases of the fires that had to be put away from the people illegally camping. So just to contextualize it. Uh, Stephen, please stop us on this Thank you. So in the future, Stephen, if you would ask one of the staff to do that, that would be very helpful. Uh, actually preferred. Thank you. No, no, no. Uh, the first time, but not, not, not this time. Okay. Um, thank you, Alex. And anyone else? Okay. All right, well, I, first of all, I want to thank everybody for your comments on this. Uh, I, I, I agree, this has been uh, really helpful and it's really good to hear from uh, folks with a variety of uh, backgrounds and uh, kinds of experiences. 
um, especially like how this may help or hurt or uh, you know affect uh, folks who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, so at this point, I would like to uh, turn it over to the council, including you, Donna. Um, so we'll we'll check in with you. Or actually, I might rely on Cameron to to know if uh, if Donna's raising her hand. Uh, but but for now. Um, Council, thoughts, reactions, comments? I have a couple, but I'll I'm just hold on to them for now. Uh, Connor, go ahead. All right. So I, I'm on the uh, Homelessness Task Force. I've uh, been on for a few months now, so I've uh, been, been hearing a lot about this issue. And I, I want to start by thanking Cameron because, you know, Cameron's taken a few hits on this, and I, I really believe um, sh she's gone out of her way to do a good job of fleshing out. Um, as sound and as kind a policy as we can come up with. Um, and, and certainly, you know, you know we're, we're doing the best we can. Uh, let's start off with a positive. It's, we have 50 people here right now sitting down trying to come up with solutions for the mid and long term here. And I think, you know, as a community, it's going to take that kind of effort to get anything over the finish line. Um, so this is one issue. This is a response to a crisis. Uh, but like we said, we have a homelessness task force. We've got city council meetings. Um, ideas such as who is going to provide some of these services? How are we going to pay for it? You know, we're largely volunteers here. We, we need the whole community to come on board and help us out with this. And I, I think we can commit to being receptive to these ideas uh, and doing our best. Uh, we've taken some strides. You know, we uh, created the homelessness task force. Uh, today, we appointed members to the restroom committee. Uh, we have a uh, homeless liaison, uh, she's here, Dawn, who's done a great job with the outreach portion, and we've uh, embedded a social worker in for Barry and Montpelier. So we're taking steps, but the steps aren't enough, right? Um, this is a crisis. Uh, statewide, 700 hotel vouchers have dried up. Uh, the Agency of Human Services has come up with no real plan to address this. Uh, so very much it's left to municipalities um, to respond to this. And I, I, I think this policy does the best we can at this moment, knowing that a policy can be nimble and a policy can change uh, to address the issues that come up out of this. And by no means is this a perfect policy. Uh, but as we talk about folks, you know, and I, I, I heard the conversation on Front Porch Forum too, and was alarmed by some of the comments of generalizations about this population. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, it hits home when folks who have experienced homelessness come up here and speak today, and I think they're very brave for doing so. Uh, but you, you can see it hurts folks. And when we say they, in many cases, it's us. I was talking to uh, a, a fella uh, a few months ago, uh, broken glasses, you know, hat in hand, and I asked him about himself. I mean, you know, and the first question, this is on me, where do you come from, you know? It's, uh, well, he, well, he said, I went to Montpelier High School. I, I grew up here. I lived on North Street, I think he said, growing up, and my parents aren't here anymore, but this is my home. And I, I've been through the mill, I've had a tough time, but this is where I come, because this is where I know where to come, because this is my community, this is my home. Um, Kathy Partlow stood up, she spoke about some of the uh, folks she serves there. Uh, I'm on the board of Mosaic, and you know, if you're in a situation where there's domestic or sexual abuse, and you're living in your partner's house, all of a sudden you find yourself homeless. So what are we going to do? What is the practice now? What is the practice now? If somebody sets up a tent, are we going to take someone like that and arrest them? If we did, Rory Tebow wouldn't prosecute it properly. Are we going to tell them to move on somewhere? Where are we going to tell them to move? And if the answer is a designated area, where is that designated area and what providers are going to provide the services and what resources are going to go to that to make sure it's a safe area? Because again, some of this population might not feel safe in a very condensed area uh, you know, when they've experienced trauma, when they've experienced addiction. Um, so cur current status quo is much broader than this policy, right? Any policy we pass is going to be more restrictive than what we're doing now because we're not going to arrest people. We're not going to criminalize homelessness. Um, so I think it's, it's time to start talking about this policy just as a very temporary measure to address the 700 people uh, who don't have vouchers anymore, who find themselves in crisis. And it's the best we can do to do that. We need to think of the long-term solutions. We need to think of the mid-term solutions. Uh, but what we shouldn't be doing is vilifying people for being homeless. And um, you know, at the, at, the, at the very least, this gives staff some direction on how to handle folks. 
and we can iron out, and I think we should wait, you know, uh, to do the due diligence, let the Parks Commission weigh in. Um, but, you know, we should pass something, knowing that it's not perfect. Um, this issue has gotten out of control as far as the framing of it. Some people have pitched it as an anti-camping policy. Some people have pitched it as, you're rolling out the welcome mat nationwide to invite people here to camp in Hubbard Park. It's neither of those things. It's direction for our staff right now in a crisis, and we have a lot more work to do. So that's my initial thoughts on it. But, you know, we got to keep working. And thanks, everybody, who showed up tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cameron, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you, um, Connor. I appreciate that. I just real quick, just for clarity around Montpelier specific situation, we don't have 700 people in our community. Sorry, yes. No, okay. I just want to make 70, sure that's 70, very 70 in Washington. Tampa, yes. Believe, um, last counts from our peer outreach worker was about 20 extra folks who are immediately facing um, emergency sleeping in our community. So just so we're all clear on the numbers. Thank you. And when you say 20 extra, could you be super clear? Yes, extra in addition to the folks that have habitually um, needed emergency camping in our community that we knew about before. Which is approximately? 15-ish. Okay. Great, thank you. Other thoughts or comments? Go ahead, Dan. Um, so the th Thoughts that I had um, uh, about this, I think, are Connor did a great job of uh, uh, summarizing uh, quite passionately uh, some of the feelings that that, that I have had uh, in response to this. One issue that I feel that I can perhaps offer some illumination on. I know there's been some questions out there in regards to Mar Martin versus the city of Boise, which is the case that Cameron referenced, and you know there have been some people saying, well, that's a Ninth Circuit decision, so that's not something we have to worry about because ninth, the Ninth Circuit is out west. It's California, Oregon, Idaho, Hawaii, I think in Alaska, uh, and Washington State. But it's uh, we're in the Second Circuit, so it doesn't apply to us. But I, I think that misses I think a larger point, which is um, you know the Martin case really is only the tip of the iceberg of a series of cases that have come out that have all said when courts have been faced with this question of fundamental, uh, you know, are you criminalizing an activity or are you criminalizing a status? Um, that uh, courts have consistently said you cannot criminalize a status. That violates the United States Constitution, the Eighth Amendment of cruel and unusual punishment. You cannot punish somebody for just simply being who they are. Um, and so Martin versus the city of Boise really reflects a, a trend on that. Um, and while it may not be technically binding in, in a legal sense, it is the leading case in the United States on that. Um, and uh, it's going, I haven't found a Second Circuit case that says otherwise, uh, or that we disagree with the holding of Martin versus city of Boise or the underlying cases that Martin builds upon. Um, so this is, this is something that's pretty well established. Um, and as I've said to uh, some people who've approached me when they've said, well, it it's not binding, one is, do we want to be the test city <laughs> so that it does become binding in the Second Circuit uh, when someone challenges us? And two, uh, do you have an argument that says why it shouldn't be? A and I think it, there isn't one in the sense that um, we are looking at these fundamental status-based issues, um, that if somebody is in the situation that this policy is intended to address, it's not because they've chosen to be there or because, um, you know, this is uh, a lark. This is, this is reflective of the complicated homelessness issue in our community, in our state, and in our nation. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, this is a very smart and reactive policy to deal with an issue that is there. And I would point out that this is the first season that we are living in this sort of post-Martin versus City of Bo Boise world. It came out in 2019, 2020 was the year of COVID when everything was wonky and people were, you know, in different housing situations. But now we're, we're starting to regain normalcy now this issue, it's time for it to be addressed. So I think this is a timely policy in that respect. 
Um, and, you know, as far as I think some of the details, I would support, you know, the, the uh, Parks uh, Board is an important elected body in the city. Um, and they have asked for an opportunity to revisit and look at some of these issues. I, I would give, feel strongly about giving them their due to have that final say, to have that review of that. Um, I would tend to, the question you asked at the beginning about whether we would feel compelled to um, uh, vote on part of this, I would tend to not want to vote on part of it only because whether or not the Parks Commission is going to weigh on both sides of it, um, I'd rather tackle, tackle this as one final policy in case they make a change that causes us to make another change. We might as well deal with it at once rather than piecemeal. It's an important enough policy. I think it gives people an opportunity to think about this. And I agree completely with Connor. This is neither a camping policy that opens the doors, nor does it legalize or, you know, uh, uh, the opposite of threatening, you know, and cracking down. This, this is just something that's in line with very basic, humane policies. And I think a lot of the conversation that people have engaged about ideas of what do we do next? What's, how do we tackle, start to tackle the homelessness issue? You know, whether it be uh, pallet houses or, you know, uh, tents or Conestoga wagons or such. That's a bigger question. And I guess I would, the, the one response that I would give is that, you know, local government has been genuinely ill-suited for this question because we haven't been a provider of these type of social services. And so there's a, there's a question of authority. Do we have the power to do this? Um, how does it fit within our state statutes and regulating, um, you know, you, you, anyone who's, I've had clients have tried to put yurts on their property and they've run afoul of sanitation issues. Um, and, you know, we're not exempt from those issues because those are state issues and those are big issues. And, and frankly, this is a regional and, and state problem. And a lot of these solutions, as I think one of the speakers said, you know, has to involve the state, has to involve our regional partners. And I would echo some of the gratitude towards, um, you know, Another Way, Good Sam, you know, uh, the various service providers that have been doing a lot of this work. And I think what, what this is is another step that we're here at the table. This is a, uh, something that deals with an immediate issue, but it doesn't, it's not intending to put that other bigger question off um, or, or ignore it. It's just, it's slightly different than what we're being asked today. Thanks. Right, yeah. Um, I just want to jump in to say, as I was saying, you know, do we want to consider voting on part of it or, uh, or just wait entirely? It occurred to me that I, I think we should just wait. <laughs> Uh, so I agree. <laughs> um, I had thought maybe maybe we could, but I, I don't I don't think that's a good idea. Unless other people, um, you know. Okay, I'm seeing seeing some sh shaking heads here. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Uh, no, I agree. I agree with you, but I just wanted to offer up as a point of clarification too for those. And I know there were um, people at the Parks Commission meeting last night that they um, are uh, appreciate the urgency of this issue um, and really feel a responsibility and a need as elected officials to be able to provide feedback as soon as possible. So I think that they've, they've called for a special meeting um, tomorrow evening. Um, I think that was as quick as they could do it. Um, maybe you helped in terms of warning that. I think it's going to be um, uh, in here. Like it was mentioned earlier, tomorrow um, evening here. So I think that um, we're not in a place where we have to wait too long to hear from them, which I think is important to continue the conversation. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Other your thoughts? Yeah, uh, Lauren and then Jack. Yeah, thanks. Um, first, just I'm really grateful for the amount of engagement. I mean, I've heard from a ton of people on this issue, personally calls, emails, in addition to, um, you know, the, the public forums. And, um, you know, thank everyone for coming out tonight. Agree and appreciate the bravery of many speakers and all of the input and appreciate all the work that staff and our homelessness task force have been doing on this issue. Um, you know, and again, appreciate everyone keeping front of mind this evening in their comments, the dignity and humanity of everyone we're talking about, of every person in our community, housed or not. Um, 
you know, I echo the disappointment that we're not getting more support and help from the state. Um, I know Cameron mentioned in her presentation, but I, I think we should invite to our next meeting, um, as you, you know, mentioned as a possibility, a state official. Let's get them in here. What are the programs? What's happening? What resources might be available? Is there an opportunity to pilot something? Is there an opportunity to, um, you know, they got all of the American Rescue Plan Act money. You know, there's, it seems like there should be some resources um, and maybe us just forcing them to <laughs> come in here and talk to us could help <laughs> shake some loose and we can, um, you know, get some more ideas on the table um, in addition to, to the work that's been done. Um, you know, I know obviously people are thinking about the emergency response in this policy and also the medium and longer term. So, you know, I think a conversation with them about all of those, you know, and part of that could be asking for clarity on their policy for state-owned land, given what a big um, chunk of state-owned land there is in Montpelier. Um, so I would love to to have that conversation, really better understand, um, you know, any opportunities there and what might be happening that they might not be um, advertising as much to us. Um, you know, I definitely have, you know, just wanted to note, I've gotten a lot of input of, you know, a whole host of concerns about the policy, impacts to our public land, safety concerns, people whose land abuts the various parks and wondering about their own, you know, how that might impact their, their property, um, concerns about how we're dealing with um, people's hygiene needs, um, you know, a lot of people wondering about the pros and cons of the aggregated area versus um, a more dispersed area. So I think, you know, maybe some more conversation of the pros and cons of the approaches or, you know, maybe an aggregate area, you know, while still allowing it elsewhere, but providing, you know, could we look into, a, um, you know, a, a flush toilet trailer as one of our speakers, or you know, and maybe that's the kind of thing where state resources could help make more feasible um, something like that. Um, I do um, a couple ideas. Some community members had offered to me. One was. Um, an idea of whatever policy we adopt of considering sunsetting it so that it would just force us to continue revisiting. I think we'll, we're going to do that anyway, but it would just, you know, I thought that was an interesting idea. It's going to be an evolving issue potentially. Um, so just thought I'd offer that. Um, and, you know, I think the, the thought of taking some more time makes sense. We can get the Parks Commission input. And, um, you know, I'd love to hear some um, responses from staff on some of the ideas that have come forward, like um, more time for holding on to people's property, what the issues are there, um, who's responding, and the appeal process. Um, and I don't know if, if the current policy addresses bus and car campers. I know that's come up tonight, but we, um, that was a point that seems like worth looking into. Um, I know a number of people have asked for more opportunity for public input. So I think the fact that we're gonna take this up again means there'll be another public hearing. So I think that's great and you know, keep the conversation going. Um, and I think just one other thing um, I think we could think about. So the police review committee, which uh, Jack and I are serving on, we're gonna be, we've tentatively, we're working on our recommendations, but one of them is to increase funding for our peer outreach work um, for the city. So I mean, we could think about, I know we're talking about our own American Rescue Plan Act funding next. Maybe we expedite that so we can get more support out on the street for folks um, knowing we're in this crisis time. So I wanted to um, put that idea out on the table. Um, and yeah, I would just echo the um, appreciation and agree to wait to vote, continue getting input and some more answers to a lot of the good ideas and issues raised tonight. Mm -hmm. and. Again, thanks to everyone who's weighing in and to the staff for taking up this issue. Great, thank you, Lauren. So, Jack, before you go, Great time, yeah, yep. I know you had a comment. Do you think you can hang on to your comment until sure. after we take a break? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we have a practice that we've uh, started in, within the last year or so of, because these meetings are so long, <laughs> taking a break at 8.30, Sort of regardless of where we are. Uh, so we are clearly not done talking about this. Um, so uh, we are gonna take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at um, 8.40 and uh, Jack, you'll get to start us off. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. Break and uh, during the break, uh, 
I discovered there was uh, someone who did not have a chance to weigh in and uh, who would like to offer a comment. And so before Jack goes, I'm um, going to give the floor to uh, Don Little, our outreach, our homelessness outreach specialist. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. Um, there, are a couple of, there are a couple of things that I, I think could use adjustment, but one of them that I really wanted to mention is that I'm hoping that the council will consider making adjustments to the 72-hour definition of an abandoned campsite, um, partly because there are a number of reasons why someone is likely to be away on occasion for more than 72 hours, um, job possibilities, emergency room visits, inclement weather, you know, a lot of things. Um, the other thing is that people who live in houses, and particularly people with cars, tend to very seriously underestimate the amount of time it takes an unhoused person to do anything, whether it's going to the bathroom, getting a drink of water, going to an appointment, running errands. You know, I mean, you and I can go to the bathroom, we can get a drink of water. Anyone outside has to walk across town to do any of these things. It can take a very long time. So 72 hours may seem like a lot of time to us, but for someone whose every action is magnified that way, both in terms of stamina and in terms of time, that's a really short length of time. And, and I'm hoping that either you know, either we could change the time frame or find some compromise, some way that the person could notify the city that they are not able to return home, but they are not, rather than forcing them to abandon everything or, or pick it up and pack it away and leave it out in the open, you know, when, just because they're gonna be gone. Um, I would really like to see that revisited. Um, there are other things that I won't go into very far at the moment, such as the, the necessary on-site um, convening of various agencies that may not always be necessary but I think that's probably a minor adjustment that we can work through um, similarly the reference to Washington County as the people to be notified um, I think that's I have talked with someone at Washington County and also with Susan Lemire and I think that's a pretty easy adjustment as well but I really did want to draw attention to the 72 hour thing um, especially in the winter when it snows if someone finds a ledge to sit under they may not want to slog through the weather to get back to their camp, and it may take them a little longer to get there, especially people with disabilities. Um, I would also draw your attention to the fact that because of COVID and the changing bus routes, a number of the sites that have been suggested as not part of sensitive areas are located in places where there is no public transportation right now. And there are a lot of people who are able-bodied enough to walk, but there are many, many people out there with chronic illnesses who would have trouble walking to Dog River, would have trouble walking to North Branch. Um, and that's just another consideration when you look at the time frame for their response to our requirements. And, and just a general thought when you're looking at the map and revising it is, is it possible for someone you know, to travel back and forth? Is there a way to address this, whether it's my ride or some other, you know, or volunteers? Or, but that's just another issue that people are dealing with in terms of where they choose to live. So. But please consider the 72 hour. If there's some way we can compromise or find a way to work that out, it would be great. Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Oh, Don, Don, what would you recommend? Hey, hey Don. Don, Sorry. what would you recommend for a time? I don't, I don't know. It's, I, I mean, a week would be nice. That's, that may sound excessive if it's in a sensitive area. A week would be nice or even if you even if you gave it another day or so and allowed the person to contact you or someone to contact you on their behalf and say look i'm coming back to this it is not abandoned or perhaps if the person people aren't going to want to leave a note that says hi i'm gone for a week because it's an invitation to to losing mm -hmm. everything but mm -hmm. um if they were to somehow indicate or have someone else indicate to you that the site was not abandoned that would be okay. you know that i think that would work okay thank you um so Thank you. Anything else, sir? Question? No, I, the only thing I was just going to suggest on, on this topic is, you know, it, and it's too, it's a little too vague, but, you know, in landlord-tenant law, there's often the idea of what constitutes abandonment, and it allows a certain mm. f level of factual inquiry. I, I don't know if we want something that, I mean, that that's very fact-based, which we probably don't want to quite go down that road, but it might be helpful to have some sort of language that would allow for that kind of factual inquiry or if there was sort of some notice that this wasn't abandoned. And it would, it, just enough time, you know, a couple more days maybe to allow people to 
maybe designate someone to go and either make contact with you or move their possessions or you know whatever needs to be done because again with the with the transportation issue with the health issues it's it's very likely to come up I think mm -hmm. so yeah all right thank Great. you thank very you much very much for all right and uh, Jack go ahead thank you I'll, I'll be brief um, I do have a few uh, thoughts and questions about the details of the uh, proposed policy I think probably this might meet, not be the best time to do it. I might catch up with uh, with Cameron or the Parks Commission after we uh, get done with uh, with our meeting tonight before uh, next time. I think it's important that we should be doing this. Um, it is not within the capacity of Montpelier under any imaginable budgetary scenario to end homelessness in Montpelier. So the proposal tonight and the other steps taken by the Homelessness Task Force are a step toward using the resources we do have to mitigate the dislocation and suffering confronted by members of our computer with community with the fewest resources and the least ability to afford a life of even basic comfort and dignity. <coughs> I think the proposed policy strikes a humane balance between not bothering people and providing information and access to needed services. I heard some people say, well, don't map us, don't find out where we are, don't approach us, don't interact us in any w with us in any way. And I understand that privacy concern. I think that the uh, interests of public health and safety and the desire to let people know what resources are available outweigh that concern in, in my view. Um, but I think it's encouraging that we're having this uh, conversation and that uh, we're going to continue to do that and move forward with this policy at our next meeting. Great. Thank you. Um, other thoughts? Um, maybe I'll Donna I'll is raising her hand. Oh, She's Donna. Back. Donna, go ahead. A, a mysterious voice. I don't know how I come across to everybody in the room. Well, we can hear you. But everyone has been so eloquent. It's just, I mean, every all the speakers, thank you, thank you. And I would highlight two of the things being said. One is we need everybody to go to our legislators, to call them, to write them, and attend the meeting when they come to city council. That is so important because they don't get enough contact from general population. They really, really need to know how important this is. And secondly, I really feel that we need to be more proactive with our housing task force and really think about that. I mean, we could have 20 pallet houses for $120,000. Now you add a community building for meals, showers, and toilets, so it's still gonna be under 150. I mean, to me, that's totally doable. It's something that could be a small but significant project as we work on bigger housing issues. So I definitely wanna have a conversation with the housing task force and down street and other organizations that work on housing. So those are my only two points. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, because you know, in the in the spirit of being inclusive here, I do see uh, Jose and Morgan. You have uh, something you'd like to say, uh, Jose? Go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, can you hear me? Yep. I wanted to uh, uh, again thank everyone for all the hard work that's been put into it, and, and actually bring something up that I think it, it kind of I was trying to think about is that this idea of criminalizing, I don't think any of you have advocated for criminalizing anything. And so therefore, I think that this this thing of bringing up the Martin versus Boise case, which was actually in response to criminalizing the activity there, you know, it's something that we should, you know, think about because I don't think it's a great idea. Uh, and the other thing is I'm, I'm really happy that you're going to give an opportunity for the Parks Commission to to kind of uh, take their time and tomorrow have their meeting because uh, they they actually mentioned in their meeting, they were not informed of any of this. They found out through the newspaper about the proposal. So it's good that you give them time. I mean, it's important because they do have maybe some fiduciary responsibility. And um, so that's great. And uh, thank you again for everything you're doing. Thank you, Jose and Morgan. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, on the question about the 72-hour um, issue, since 
I had raised it earlier, um, at least five days, you know, and if it could be a week. And I agree with everything Don uh, had articulated very well. Uh, so I would please encourage you uh, find a way to uh, work that out. It would really be good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, I, I have a few comments that I want to make here. First of all, uh, I am I'm also I just want to echo the gratitude that others have expressed. Um, thanks uh, to Cameron and the staff uh, for putting this together. Thank you to the, the Homelessness Task Force for uh, for spending a lot of time uh, talking about this. Uh, I know uh, the um, uh, Green Mountain Cemetery Commission has also spent time uh, talking about this. Gra I'm grateful for, for their uh, input as well. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful that the uh, Parks Commission is uh, uh, meeting tomorrow, that they're taking the time to have a special meeting to, to discuss this. Um, that's really valuable. Um, so just a, a few things that I want to highlight, uh, really, that came from people that spoke uh, this evening that I, I want to uh, just at least highlight as potential tweaks. Um, so one is I, I thought Vanessa's comment about uh, not wanting to be woken up was really valid and uh, wonder if we could include some language in that, um, you know, that it's, I, I'm not sure what the right framing is, but something like during daylight hours or, you know, when it's, you know, clear that the person is not asleep or, you know, so just something to that effect, I think, um, is reasonable. Um, I, I'm hearing, uh, you know, I, well, I, I really appreciate um, what Don said uh, about, and, and Morgan too, Morgan and Don both um, mentioned this, um, the, the idea that 72 hours may not be enough and uh, if there can be some, some tweaks to that, you know, whether that's five days or notifying um, someone either at the city or an agency or, or something uh, that a site is not abandoned and that folks are, are coming back to it. Um, that seems uh, valuable. And, and again, uh, something that Don mentioned that Morgan also mentioned, um, is, is Washington County the, just the, the, right, um, the right person or should there be, uh, as Morgan mentioned, a, a menu of folks, and I'm sure once city staff is is aware that it may become clear, <laughs> like who the right um, folks might be. Um, I'm not sure how you frame that, but just want to echo that. Um, and then um, something that uh, Steve brought up uh, about state land. Now, to be fair, I don't think this is the right policy to have to to mention state land that because that is outside of our purview. Uh, but just want to highlight the importance of state land as a part of the conversation, you know, especially as we hear from the Parks Commission what their thinking is uh, around how this applies to parks. Uh, I think there's going to be a question of like, what land are we are we really talking about? And uh, the fact that state land is uh, already in the mix, certainly, and uh, the state, uh, to my knowledge, does not have any policy similar to this. Um, you know, I, I think it's fair to to consider holistically what areas we're, we're talking about. Um, so for now, those are the, just the things that I wanted to highlight. And um, yeah, I, am, I, I think this is the, the right direction um, for us to go in. And you know, I really appreciate folks' comments about the desire for uh, tiny houses, the desire for uh, uh, staffed congregate space, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, not individual sort of dispersed space, I suppose, uh, and that there are a lot of challenges uh, to that, and this does not preclude pursuing that sometime in the, in the future, but this is, I think, the, the right first step uh, for us. Um, so. Having said that, any other comments? Uh, yeah, go ahead. So uh, we certainly appreciate all the, the feedback, and we'll take a look at the issues that were raised, uh, specifically the ones you are articulated, but there were some others people wanted to get some feedback on. We'll also see if we can invite a state official to our next meeting. 
Um, one thing I did want to mention is that uh, a key part of this is sort of direction to our staff about how to handle this. So what, I mean, we'll talk this over tomorrow, but I may issue an interim directive to staff along these lines with some of these changes in it um, so that at least between now and whenever we vote a policy, right. we have some clarities for our staff, but obviously that wouldn't deal with the, the land and, and that kind of thing, but just so that people understand that um, so our staff isn't like, what do we do? Yeah. But certainly uh, we would err on the, the, the broader side of any of these uh, topics that have been raised out of, you know, I think they're all great points. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you for everyone um, here for your feedback and for the folks on Zoom. And we'll be meeting a staff to sort of look at what we can implement and what we can change. And I look forward to taking all of the suggestions and um, looking over the policy. So Great. just appreciate that. Thank you. Um, OK, any other comments? Great. Minutes, or 30 seconds. Um, 30 seconds. Uh, but you got to come up and sit up here. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Whitaker again. Uh, don't underestimate that this is an emergency created by the confluence of the governor's action, the economic services, the hotel voucher. The ARPA money that's unspent right now might never be seen again. And I would ask you to consider moving with all urgency to get a plan in place for this, what I call interim scalable solutions, because we might not have this money available in 2022. Uh, or 2023. Thank you. Okay. All right, so we are going to move on um, for now then, and I anticipate that we will likely take this up again at our next meeting, which is uh, August 18th, um, which is not, I, usually we meet on the second and fourth Wednesdays, and that is the third, I believe. So it's um, sort of an oddly scheduled meeting. Okay, all right, so we are, we're gonna move on uh, to the conversation about uh, ARPA funding and uh, sort of where we're at with that. And for this, I, um, uh, am I turning this over to you, Bill, or sure. to Cameron? Sure, well, I'll, uh, Kelly. Or Kelly, <laughs> great. Uh, but basically, while, while Kelly comes up and we can go through this in more detail, I think the short story here is, as you know, we had originally, um, been told we were going to be getting a little over two million dollars for two years, over two years, so 1.1 million a year essentially. Um, that's been revised now to 771 thousand dollars over two years um, because of the county provision. Now, um, as we understand it, there's still discussions. Uh, our, our delegation, the governor, are still urging Treasury to send this money directly to cities and towns. Um, but there's also a discussion that if the money does go to the counties, which is what Treasury is interpreting it, that the counties may turn it over to the state and or the cities and towns. However, um, we understand that there are some county needs as well, you know, old uh, courthouse buildings that need HVAC systems and those kinds of things. So there may be some negotiations. So we don't know if we'll get it, when we would get it, and what the quantity would be. So at this point, we don't believe we can rely on any of it until we know more of that. So what we do know is that we'll be getting about $385,000 this year and $385,000 next year. And you know, in a, prior to the conversation that we've had tonight, uh, we were looking at our earlier conversation when the council outlined three or four sort of general guidelines for use of this money, but the biggest one being um, restoring lost revenue and restoring projects and work that had been cut last year and this year because of lack of money. And given the relatively small amount uh, in, in the scheme of things, our recommendation was to put this into the capital plan um, for to restore those types of projects, paving, et cetera. Um, obviously, we've had to delay a lot of that, and it's, it's getting bad. Clearly, if there's other things that are eligible that we want to figure out, well, of course, it's your choice. Uh, but that's, but we do need to make a decision. Um, we would expect to be getting the funds end of August. Probably mid-August mid or so. August. It's so about 30 days out from when we certify, which is the, the 13th. The money in place. So 
that's the background. We can talk in more detail. Kelly can talk more about anything, including the financial report that you got earlier. Sorry, is this and is this list the order of which we would spend it then? Um, so the priority list that you have in front of you is the list that we put together with the original sum of money in mind, and now you'll notice that it's much smaller, and so we wanted to come back around and talk to you about that funding and how we might utilize it now and in the future. I mean, we do have a little bit of time to spend this money, but we also have some pretty significant infrastructure needs. Um, and on the consent agenda tonight, for example, there was the paving contract, and these funds could be used there right. um, so to really do some things. Right. So we bid out the paving contract with only with the money that we had in our regular budget. But this can supplement that. I mean, typically, you get a better price the more you do. And it's, it's so I think those would be the kind of things. I mean, we all hear about the condition of the roads, and they're in terrible shape. But there's certainly plenty of other needs that as well. But at this point, we would simply say identify it to capital projects and we'll put it to the highest priority needs um, unless you want to do something else with all of, or, or part of the money. But we would like to get, we'd like to know at least how much is going to go toward capital projects so we can start using it. You know, this is, it's already midsummer, um, so the, our season of using it is shrinking. Anything further you want to? I don't have a lot more to present on it. We just really wanted to bring it for discussion purposes, um, just because we do have a need now um, that you know would certainly help us going forward. But we also know that based on the last conversation, there may be other things that you wanted to think about with this first um, allotment. Comments, thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Do we have any senses through it? You got to talk into your, your thing. Okay. Sorry. Do we have any sense about the timeline for when this sort of county um, issue would be resolved? Is this so it could be a year or two? Um, hopefully not two. Hopefully. Yeah. But I mean, there's no there's no promise that they're just around the corner or that they're engaged in no. substantive. We don't know. No. Yeah. Okay. It did get the opportunity to meet with Senator Sanders the other day, and we talked mm -hmm. about that very question. And he mentioned that they, that he does not know when, uh, what the timeline is. Yeah. So. Okay. Yep. We'll just keep our eyes out for gilded courthouse towers, <laughs> and we'll know. <laughs> we'll know it's been released. <laughs> Other thoughts or comments? And Donna. Oh yes, Donna, go ahead. I just, you know, I guess in a quick priority to me are streets and sidewalks and as far as going through and picking the exact ones i'm not equipped to do that today no and we're not asking the council to pick specific projects i think but just getting yeah. I, for uh, if you can just say we want to allocate all or whatever portion you want to the capital fund we will do the priority of the projects and and i think we agree with you that streets and sidewalks um but are I in also the, don't and, and lose that housing trust money I want to give them some of it. I'm confused by that comment. Can you explain that? Well, when I first glanced, the, the equipment and streets, I guess, are my priority. But I also, there's money in here for the housing trust fund. I, and I, well, on the $1 million list, it was, that was, rest so this was the list, going down the list of items that we had had in the budget and took out due to revenue shortfalls and so the to qualify for revenue replacement this was basically putting those things so so we had reduced the housing trust fund by sixty thousand dollars or not took oh, it from okay. them but didn't appropriate as much as we might have sorry so can you say that one more time donna you would prioritize the housing trust fund money or n or not i guess if i had to do a proportion i guess you take We'd have to go down percentage-wise, but I see streets and sidewalks, but I want to share to go into the housing to restore the money we took from that. Even if it was just a little bit, on the list is $60,000, you know? Yeah. Maybe $20,000, but something mm -hmm. to get the housing trust fund back up. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I don't want to delay the trucks. 
Uh, I see that there's at least three trucks on here, but I want to note that we are going to be having a presentation from VEIC Net Zero 2030 plan. So, and just, yeah, go ahead. Just to be clear, we're, the, the trucks aren't really in play. This was, th oh, okay. this was really, I hope, I'm sorry if this is confusing. This was the list we had okay. way back in this, you know, when we okay. thought we were getting this much money. Gotcha. What we're saying to you is we can't buy all of this. <laughs> If we want to do road and street projects that we cut, now's the time to do it. So we'd rec when I say the capital fund, I specifically didn't say capital and equipment fund. So okay. I don't want to be any. Okay. So we really want to put this to capital projects. The water and sewer projects are different. They're funded separately, and there are additional ARPA funds for water and sewer projects. So we would be talking about specifically street, sidewalk, you know, okay. retaining wall, those types of needs that, that are pent up and old that need to be addressed. Sorry, thank you for that <laughs> clarification. Uh, other thoughts, comments? Are you looking for, sorry. Sure, are, go ahead. Are you looking for a motion along those well, lines? Well, I don't just, think I don't there needs to be, well actually, so before we go there, uh, Lauren, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, I guess just wanted to raise, so I mean, I think this approach, this is what we had all agreed to, this general, you know, I think we all know that our infrastructure needs uh, needs work so I think this makes total sense I am still interested and in, I mean maybe if we said like I don't know what the right amount is 50,000 like we kind of temporarily put on hold and come back August 18th with some of this work that's happening if there is an opportunity I don't even know if we could staff someone quickly enough to do additional peer outreach or I mean I'm just thinking you know this money is for you know responding to the COVID emergency so if there's human needs go mm. yeah too loud it's good better yeah good um so i mean i'd be interested in exploring if there's still doing it <laughs> um if if there would be you know some way and i don't know from the homelessness task force or again this is a recommendation that we're going to be putting forward i believe from the police review committee to to beef up um that kind of support for community members so it seems like arpa funds would be a good you know helping people in emergency in our community right now, um, some piece of that. So I don't know if we could just say, like, let's explore a little bit of this to be go towards that and could look at some proposal. And I'd be happy to work with city staff in the, over the next month if, that's, if people are amenable or open to that. So to answer both questions, both Dan's and, and yours, I think we do need a motion because we'd like to get, if we're going to go forward to allocate this to projects, we'd like to know specifically what you're putting toward it. I don't see any reason why you can't put money on hold, even for undesignated purposes, to be further discussed, and we can look into the eligibility and how that would work. You know, if even if at the next meeting you say, okay, we'll just put it to more streets, we can add probably add on to the paving contract and add more <coughs> streets. So I don't think there's any you know, preventing work from being done. If but I think that would be a perfectly appropriate way to handle it if that's what you wanted to do. Connor, go ahead. Lauren want to make a motion, I would second that. But uh, otherwise, uh, similar to Dan, I think we're generally going in the right direction. I wouldn't want to micromanage staff so much on some of these projects here. And I think we all know the, the roads and the sidewalks are in disrepair. So um, a lot of this seems like you're, you're going in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, my inclination is to, uh, to uh, is to try to replace the the projects that were canceled because uh, I feel like we uh, we have some obligation to the public on that um, because that is what they voted for uh, and if we are uh, so uh, I realize that's a little bit in conflict with like saving out fifty thousand dollars but I'm I would also be fine to do that and we can come back and have that conversation about that because we could still decide like yes this we are still. Uh, it, it would still be worthwhile to to replace projects that have been canceled um, versus something else, but um, but we don't really know what that something else is uh, right now. So um, yeah, uh, other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. I I mean I I, I think um, so. Maybe this is Pollyanna-ish, but I I have to think that the remainder of this money will be coming to us in some form or another, whether it's going to be the full 
two million that was promised or you know some percentage of it um, and I guess you know given the realities of this I, I do think that there's an obligation to just you know give the staff the flexibility to um, put the capital fund put this to the capital fund projects um, with the anticipation that you know once this next sort of segment of money comes free we can start to be we'd start to go back and put on our creative hats and think about this in, in the meantime but that this is sort of uh, not pretty but these are essential projects that are going to really affect people's quality of life um, and they're worth their as you say things they voted and approved to do so that that would be my inclination So it sounds like we need a promotion. Other th thoughts or? Uh, so I just, oh, quick, ahead, just quick question is, so are we thinking that we would hold back and reserve some funds? I mean, I guess what I'm trying to square in my mind is, you know, when we originally approached the full pot, as, as Congressman Welch said, that, hey, this is what's coming, we approached it as let's, let's with the first batch, let's manage everything that we had already budgeted for, and then when, when the second round comes through, then we may be able to approach that with some discretion. So are, are we in a place now where we're kind of want to hedge and where we're going to give discretion to staff, which I absolutely agree with, to, to manage you know, you know, those original priorities, but knowing you know, a couple, a zero has been removed. So you know, what, what, what do we want to, deal with in terms of, of discretionary relative to what um, is priority. You know, I, I agree with Donna and, and, you know, that we need to focus on infrastructure and these are things that the voters have, you know, have approved in our budget. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around what our approach should be here. Should we, should we withhold some so that we may have some discretion down the road or are we going to take a leap of faith and hope, as Dan says, that you know, it will eventually come through, but not knowing what that timing is, so. I think that's exactly the question. Yeah. <laughs> and that was also my understanding, right, that we would dedicate the first batch to replacing what would had been voted on and then wait until the second batch. And, and if we had been able to, to get the whole 2.5, uh, 2.1. 2.1. Oh, sorry, 1. Okay. 5.8. <laughs> oh, there was a five in there. Okay, <laughs> two point one, uh, roughly. Um, that, th if I understood that correctly, that would have covered at least projects that were strictly just canceled. Right. We had about a one point four million that we had right. canceled yeah. out, and then the remaining six hundred we had. Right. Then you had kind of said we'd like to look at these generally as how, how we do that. But yeah. At this point, the remaining six hundred is almost the full seven hundred. Right. Right. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, I guess I had, I had been thinking it more as the amounts, and so we were thinking, just given the timing issue, you know, the emergency is now, so waiting a year to address people in crisis is not as useful. So I, I you know, I, I, if everyone's supporting <laughs> moving forward, like I agree that you know we need to be doing all of it. So, um, you know, our. I guess I would just say, if, you know, if we could take 50,000 just short term, it very well might get applied in August to more paving and sidewalks. But if, you know, talking with people, there's some, you know, addressing an emergency that was created by COVID that is harming people in our community, and there's a good way to spend that working with the stakeholders, I think that would be a very humane thing to do, um, and it's a small portion of the overall, and was consistent with like the theory we had of mostly infrastructure, but some portion for human needs mm. due to COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack. I agree with uh, Lauren. Two things to say. One is that we have uh, a member of the public uh, raising his hand to, to be heard. Um, Thank you. Morgan Brown is asking to be heard. Um, and I, I agree with, uh, with Lauren's approach. And you know, I don't know whether it, the use for that money will be try to hire somebody or potentially invest in some equipment that uh, 
could be used to meet needs of homeless people or so I, I don't think we need to decide that tonight but I do think it is uh, useful to hold back well I'll just make this as a motion I move that we uh, authorize the uh, city manager to uh, or should it be the city manager sure. <laughs> authorize the city manager to uh, make uh, make expenditures and allocations uh, consistent with the uh, undone uh, capital projects except for uh, $50,000 that we would hold back uh, for future allocation. So if I heard you correctly, you said you'd, you'd make a motion to allocate $335,000 to the capital fund and the remaining 50 did to be discussed at the next meeting? Is that how you said that? That's, I think that's exactly what I was <laughs> saying. I yeah. <laughs> uh, Connor. And just piggybacking off that, Lauren was saying, you know, we, we might have some unmet needs coming up. Like today we appointed the members of the restroom committee, right? Um, as this committee delves into the work, there may be expenses that come up as far as, you know, architectural renderings. We were looking for a permanent structure. Uh, but you need money for that, so if we're, if we're serious about it, you know. Mm -hmm. Also, maybe interim facilities and washing facilities, uh, just to get us through the next few months. So. so is that a second also? It's a second. It's well, okay. Okay, good, <laughs> good. Okay. Um, Morgan, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Jack. Um, so on these upper fund, uh, funds, um, not to take anything away from what's needed for streets and sidewalks, and also uh, the housing trust fund. Thank you, Donna. Um, it would be good to also, if possible, prioritize uh, funding for hygiene facilities and also uh, additional funding for street outreach. Eat, uh, excuse me, street outreach worker. Uh, program because you know Don's one person and she's working real hard and you know the initial ask way back was for two positions and you know that's needed and really I mean not to speak for Don but ask her I mean it's it's amazing how much work needs to be done and it's going to get more as there's more people going to be uh, living on house at the door. So please consider those. Thank you very much. Thank you, Morgan. Um, all right. Well, so um, also, Donna, I just want to check in with you uh, about this because uh, it's not, I, you know, it's saving out $50,000, um, some of which I suppose could go to the housing trust fund as well, but all of that Unless, well, anyway, I just want to give you the opportunity to, to weigh in, Donna. Well, when we spend that 50000 I'm definitely going to advocate for housing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, okay. Well, so there has been a motion and a second. Any further discussion on this? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. All right, so thank you. Um, that is how we will deal with that. And that, um, we do anticipate having an executive session a little later, but before we do that, we're gonna go um, uh, through council reports. And uh, Donna, I know you're not present with us, but would you still be up for going first? Well, I, I'll certainly go first okay. and just say, I'm just so pleased we had so many uh, people participating tonight. That's all I have to say. Thank you all for coming or getting online with us. Great. Thank you. Connor. Uh, I'll just uh, ditto that and uh, pass otherwise, thanks. Uh, Jay. Uh, just a quick acknowledgement and thanks to um, the Parks, Smart, excuse me, Parks Department and their, the creation of the Montpelier Youth Conservation Corps. Many of you maybe have seen folks out working, um, building a bridge in Hubbard Park up by the new shelter um, in hazmat suits, tearing out poison ivy, 
not always successfully and <laughs> without without issue, but that's okay. Uh, it's just, I, and, and then working out at the at the um, farm at Homeway, and I think that um, this is, you know as, as an early program has been hugely successful. My son participated and just had a great experience, and so I just want to um, just a quick thanks for 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 that effort. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Uh, yeah, I want to give uh, a shout out to the rec department uh, for opening the Montpelier pool. Um, it was a very big, heavy, quick lift, but they did it fantastically. It's operating. Uh, I've been there many times, and, uh, you know, especially on hot days, it's been really busy. And uh, it's certainly, there have been a number of people in, uh, in this city who've enjoyed that. Um, and it's really wonderful to see that. I think it's one sign of a return to norm to towards normalcy. So I'm very grateful for all the hard work they put in to make that happen. And I know it was not an easy or quick lift. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Jack. Well, I'll say what I think uh, all of us are thinking, which is that uh, it's really great to be back in person and um, this is the second city meeting that I've been to in person this week, and uh, I think already between Monday and tonight, we've seen a real improvement in the technology so that uh, people have been able to participate uh, in a hybrid fashion. Um, another observation that I would make is that I had a call from uh, from a resident earlier this week talking about the encampment policy and she says to me so do, do you know about uh, Mill Pond Park and what impact this uh, would have on Mill Pond Park and I told her well I don't really know about Mill Pond Park and uh, but I promised her that I would go out and and visit it before our meeting tonight and uh, for anyone who doesn't know about it it's a it's a tiny beautiful little park on uh, elm street on the river out by uh, winter street and uh, i walked around there for a few minutes saw a kingfisher flying up the river and uh, it's something that people should visit it's a, it's a great little, of all the beautiful spots in Montpelier, and there are many of them, this is one that people probably aren't aware of, and I recommend that you visit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, again, just gratitude for all the participation and people weighing in tonight and lots and lots of outreach um, I know I've been getting and I'm sure all of you have um, so great to see people involved um, and wanted to also just express my thanks to um, both the staff Cameron and Chief Pete and the volunteers on the police review committee we've been working incredibly hard a uh, lot of hours going in really excited to bring forward the report that that group is putting together um, one of our next upcoming meetings, but just want to acknowledge a, an immense amount of time that staff and the volunteers have been putting in. Um, so thanks to, to everyone for that. Great. Uh, so I just want to report on um, the next meeting is August 18th, which is, as I mentioned before, it's the third Wednesday, so it's a little bit odd. Uh, and I just wanted to note that the um, folks that we commissioned to do the Net Zero 2030 plan, VEIC, uh, are starting to wind that down. They're, they're getting some final comments and they anticipate anyway being ready to present to us on the 18th. And uh, that Net Zero 2030 plan, it's like a, a roadmap for how we could potentially get to uh, Net Zero for city operations. Uh, also includes the schools. And so just a, a heads up that I've been in touch with uh, Jim Murphy, um, school board chair, to see if we want to try to have some kind of a joint meeting uh, for that presentation since uh, they are very much a part of that plan. 
Uh, and th he was gonna talk with the school board tonight about what they wanted to do. It's possible that they that, that doesn't work and they don't wanna do that, and that perf that's perfectly fine, um, but just wanted to make folks aware that um, that is a possibility. Uh, and so if we had a, a joint meeting, well, I'm not sure, I, ooh, I assume it would be here, but I could be wrong about that too. Um, up two sets of procedures to follow. Uh, similar to, the, I mean, the last time we did that was when we had um, Barry here for a joint meeting. That was, uh, you know, like, it was interesting. Like, and it worked and it was fine, but um, we had to navigate by a couple sets of rules. Anyway, uh, that, that is it for me. Oh, uh, John. Oh, just that, I love that little part. And what you do <laughs> is you go to Birch Grove and you get your coffee and your muffins and then you just walk down there and sit there and watch. That, that's what we do. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Bill. That was it? No pom pom. <laughs> Fair enough. So I got, I've got a few things. Um, also, with regard to the next meeting, um, obviously we will have this homelessness issue on the table as well. So between that and, and net zero, probably have a pretty full agenda, so I'll let maybe talk about whether that's all the night for the police. It won't be done. So, so yeah, we'll just be looking at our schedules there. Um, <coughs> so just juggling, juggling, and I think CJAC maybe, uh, so they were planning to come that night, so we'll have to, we'll have to see. So just, that's, so there's that. Um, one thing, someone mentioned the pool. Um, some people may have noticed that the pool tower doesn't have the normal plat plank that you walk out to jump off of. Those are taken down each year for maintenance and often need some upgrading and r repair. And they get inspected by an independent third party because of COVID and retirements in our rec department, they were sort of put away. So we're not sure if they're safe to put up yet, so we're gonna be doing due diligence on that, but if people ask or wonder why they're not up. It's not that we don't want the kids to dive off the high tower, it's just we want to make sure if they do so, it's safe. So there's that. Uh, earlier tonight we mentioned Garden Park and we've had a lot of conversations about that and as Steve correctly noted, there's been a fair amount of issues. So I think we reached a conclusion, we took a look at counter council's actions and on January 13 and again on March 14, uh, April 14, you voted to approve grants a grant which would redesign that whole area on 12 Main Street, and that included moving Girton Park to that spot. And we didn't get the grants for the whole design, but unless you tell me otherwise, we're gonna assume that that vote meant to move the park, and we can do that with our own people, and we'll be doing that as soon as we can schedule it. So we will be moving it there, putting it in the location as per that plan that you voted, and um, cleaning it and all of that. We think it's time probably beyond time that that happens. So we're just planning to take that action. Um, and just if you'll indulge me two seconds, because you mentioned the double meaning. I was talking to someone when I was on vacation, a fellow manager, and they told me that there's a town in Maryland, but it's also in Delaware. It, it, it's on, it crosses oh. both. It, so the, I can't remember, I'm trying to remember the name of the town. And so they actually have two mayors, two councils, but one manager, one police department, one everything. So they have to do everything, not only with two towns, but two state laws, and funding, and all of that. So a joint meeting with the school board doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> 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 That's pretty honorous. Yeah. Del Delmar. Delmar, yes, thank you. <laughs> all right, um, and so uh, we anticipate that uh, we have some things to discuss in executive session. Yes, we do, two things. Um, so, uh, one is a legal update regarding the hotel and garage project. The other is uh, collective bargaining statuses. Uh, and so is there a, can we, we can have one motion to do bo both maybe? Uh, yes, go ahead. Just curious, I heard from um, several community members kind of concerned that we're having a garage conversation in executive session. I know the piece that we do need to talk about does need to be an executive session, but maybe just we could give it I don't know, a, an update of what's happening and why we need to go into executive session so people understand why, like what's, 
whatever can be said public well, well i think just to give sure context. so we we've had recent decisions from the courts and um we need to update the impact on that and what that means for us moving forward and if we should move forward if we shouldn't and how how that impacts so that's what we'll be talking about legal strategy yep yep thank you yeah that's a fair question uh yeah jack I move that we find that premature general public knowledge of uh, the contract negotiations and uh, pending civil litigation will clearly place the city at a substantial disadvantage. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? And uh, is there another motion? I move that we enter executive session to discuss the uh, collective bargaining negotiations and uh, the status of the uh, litigation that we've been that I just mentioned second okay uh, motion and second any further discussion oh I should say that that motion includes uh, having the uh, city manager and anybody else or just no, and okay. city manager in attendance okay um, no. all, all right so Okay. Um, you can join in then. Well, someone has to be out oh. here. Yeah. That's fair. Okay. Um, there's been a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Great. Thank you. And we will return to adjourn, right. basically. So you won't do any decision after.